Mr. Frega? Yeah, it's great. Different stuff. Gentlemen. Welcome. Welcome to Techno Social, ladies and gentlemen. We have Daniel Garner with us. It's great to be here, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we were just already uh, well on our way uh, through our, our exchange, but Owen decided to pull the trigger and record it uh, live so you can see the raw, unedited madness that will be this Techno Social. Uh, how are you doing tonight, gentlemen? We're doing well. Uh, you know, we, I, I had the pleasure of, we had a big snowstorm here in Virginia. And, you know, when you lose electricity for about 12 hours, you realize um, how important electricity is. Uh, so that was, that was quite fun. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, the kids loved it because they, they took all the sleeping bags and they said, we're going to go camping and it's going to be so much fun. But then when you actually go outside to begin camping, you're like, I like camping indoors, actually. Uh, so <laughs> we, we are all doing well. Uh, so thank you for asking, Mr. Frey. It's really, really a delight, Mr. Cock. Really lovely to speak with you, gentlemen. So tell me, are we here with OG Rose or Daniel Garner? That is a very good question now, isn't it? You know, OG Rose is Opperman Garner Rose. Opperman is uh, Michelle's last name, Garner my last name, Rose her middle name. We made that in 2011 and it's kind of like rise together, you know, because we do so much of the papers and things we do, we're talking, come at it, then you go and write and she'll do different things. So this kind of coming uh, together. So, you know, I, I, I'm afraid to say I will not be as lovely as my wife. I will do my best. Uh, so, and I'm afraid you only get the G, not the O and the, or the Rose. So you're really getting a raw deal here. Gentlemen, I'm really it's a lie. We're here with G Rose. Yeah, all you're getting is the G. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> We're here with the G. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So where do we start this one? Um, Daniel, why don't you tell us a little bit about sort of your background and your, your interests uh, so that people who don't know you can get a little bit of, a, of an understanding of where you're coming from and where, uh, you know, they can expect this conversation to riff into. Well, let's see. I, I live on a Black Angus farm, was born on a Black Angus farm, spent my childhood walking in the woods, uh, started a science fiction series when I was younger called The Sword of Tribulation and did all those different things, proceeded to uh, master the art of pushing my younger brother down a staircase. Uh, I, you know, rats cross country, and different things like that. So a lot of writing. Um, I, I, you know, we wrote, my wife and I, we wrote a book uh, called The Conflict of Mind, which is book one of a trilogy called The Truism and the Rational, which is really sort of exploring how thinking structures reality toward us in manners of which can sometimes deceive us with coherence from correspondence, to use that language. We do, we actually do a lot in fiction. We have a short story collection, Under the Wing, a novel to turn the world. Uh, to turn the world is a world where people go outside one day and they look up and there are these people floating in the sky and they're like, what in the world is going on? Everyone freaks out. And so everyone goes inside, but two weeks go by and nothing happens. So people assume that it's going to be okay. So they try to go back. They go back to trying to live their lives with these people floating in the skies if they're not there. Uh, and how the just presence of an unknown shapes people's dailies interaction, even if that uh, presence is not doing anything oh. uh, directly to them. Uh, so they're called the floaters or different. It's a fiction uh, story. You know, uh, what, you know, you wake up in the morning, it depends on how strong the coffee is, uh, and that will send you in various directions. Uh, you know, uh, you, very often I'll, I'll talk about David Hume. I like the Scottish Enlightenment. I think it's like, uh, but, you know, obviously David Hume with his critique of autonomous rationality. Uh, the Co uh, did a lot in economics, uh, different fields like that. So, uh, you know, this, that, and so forth and uh, unloaded trucks at a uh, wholesale for a bunch of years and won a wedding venue now. Let me tell you, running a venue during COVID, mm, life choices. Uh, so, <laughs> so mostly different things like that. Okay. Oh, well, the floaters, they don't do anything, but they structure everybody's life. Where have I heard yes. that before? Uh, you know, it brings about, I tell you what. <laughs> no, it's such an interesting concept. I mean, I guess that from, from Owen and I and, and mine's part, We've been riffing a lot recently on <clears throat> this idea that the non-existent or that which isn't there is perhaps uh, the fundamental structuring fact of our symbolic orders of our reality, right? Mm. Uh, one of the biggest realizations I've had in the past few months was like looking around me <clears throat> and seeing that everywhere that I see, God isn't. Mm but his non-existence is ever present. So this apophatic view of God really mm. sent me on a, on a, on a path, right. On a path around working, not only with addition and with existence, but also with negativity and with absence and with that, which isn't there, for example, meaning, for example, coherence, mm. um, you know, should we expect coherence when the world is full of floaters? Maybe not. 
Well, no, it's, you know, it's, it's quite funny, right? Because we spend the majority of our lives almost um, looking through them. You know, I'm not simply uh, when I'm drinking my coffee, thinking about the coffee cup. I, I rarely notice, say, the color of the coffee cup or what it's designed. I'm going straight to the task of drinking it, uh, especially if I've forgotten it, everything I've learned from like the Kyoto school, a different thing, like the pure experience or something. Uh, so it, it's, it's funny because the very, uh, a very large percentage of our life and arguably the majority of our life is actually toward things that are not there and yet are not nothing. You see, one of the things that's really gotten us in trouble is thinking that there's being or nothing. And like we talk with Cadell and Ebert and, and Mr. Adlin, different things. There's also a third category with, and also Jockin and Javier um, of lo- what I like to call lack. And, you know, what, what lack would be uh, is the idea of an absent present. So, for example, like if right now I really want a tomato sandwich, like really badly, it's not merely nothing, just like the absence of a new car or something like that. Like I am toward, you know, toward that tomato sandwich because I want it. So it's like a present absence. It's present and yet it is not here. And this is kind of a third ontological category as mm-hmm. opposed to just being or, or nothing. But since we tend to be trapped um, yeah, I think Derrida is quite correct often when he talks about how we get trapped in dichotomies of, of thinking where it's either or and you want to break that down. Um, but since we have mostly philosophically and also in our own lives thought about things in terms of, um, you know, being or nothing, we haven't really appreciated the role of lack, which I think that your work ontological design, well, because like, for example, so much that's so lovely. It's not like technology, for example. It's not it's not like my screen when I'm looking at um, the phone or something like that. It's not like it's directly like push me to do certain ways, or it's like reaching a handout and changing how my brain works or different things. There's the lack of a direct uh, relationship. And yet that is very, very present and very, very real. Uh, and mm. so much of our life is actually structured by these lacks. Um, in a similar way, you know, what the conflict of mind will also talk about, like with my friend Lorenzo, is we, um, we've also gotten in trouble because we tend to think in terms of rational versus irrational, when actually there's also non-rational. Uh, which is actually kind of um, the third category that structures rationality. Um, right. Like I, for example, cannot uh, comprehend or um, transcribe an experience purely into rational terms, but that, that does not mean it is not real. It exists in the state of a non-rationality that then I understand it into something meaningful to me through rationality. And that doesn't mean rationality doesn't matter and it's not necessary, but that there's a third category of non-rationality. So I'm starting to see, it's, it's quite wonderful. I think there's a movement... Um, yeah, rather it be theology, philosophy, different things, mm-hmm. um, that seems to appreciate these third categories mm-hmm. that have been missing from, from thought for a long time. I think that's, that's very, very important. It's these less than nothings that are a mm. little bit like nothings within a cage, mm. within a cage of uh, concepts that we give it, and therefore we can grasp them because they are positive meanings, but they all somehow have a weird relationship of mediating whether inversely or directly or or manipulating or channeling that nothingness that they they, mm. they establish relationships of force mm. between us and that nothing because look around you where's nothing it isn't it isn't but it structures everything <clears throat> and that's the craziest thing we speak about one of the great mistakes that even i make is to speak of nothing as if it was a positive oh nothing mm. is the very important no nothing isn't <laughs> And and, that, and that's the crazy bit to wrap our heads around because all we see are positive presences, um, and so oh, yeah. the dictator in me or the or the the crazy guy in me just 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 is excited about the idea of the managed purveyance of nothing management apparatuses in a network that could perhaps change the order of the world, and perhaps always already constantly do. Oh sure, but, that's you know, how, but, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. And it's just funny because it's an example where, um, you know, like, for example, in English, I don't know of a word that readily captures this middle space between nothing and being. Right. And so it's funny to think how I, I do think you see in that how language can capture thinking. You, you know, there's the idea, as you as you reference, you know, we um, we make our tools and then our tools make us. Right. So in a similar way, we make our language and our language makes up. We make mm. our metaphors and our metaphors make up. So it's just it's quite fascinating that so much of philosophical thinking theology has been a caught between you, you mentioned theology, like the negative theology versus the positive theology. Yeah. And it's kind of been a back and forth. It's like, well, you know, if you make God presence, that's uh, if he's too present in your theology, that risks um, heresy because you're bringing him down to a human level and human con- con- um, conceptability. But then if you make him too distant and too absent, then what do you even mean when you say God is good? Like, what does the word good have to do with God at all? Because he's so other that even the word good not. And so would it be better to say God is not 
good. Well, then what then what are we even talking about? Like, what does the word God even do? So there's this risk when you go too far that then you make it too other to even be like it's almost an it's almost an it almost has to get to the place where it can be an other other. Like it's so far other that you can't even relate to it as another, uh, because that's the funny thing of like you have. Um, I guess if I would use the terms like you have um, pure difference similarity slash difference, because if there's similarity between two things and they're not the same, they can't be, there has to be difference. And yet that yeah. difference makes the possibility meaningful similarity. And if two things are the same, well, then they're not two things. Uh, they're just one thing. So most things have to exist in this middle ground of similarity slash difference. And if it's pure difference, well, then you can't relate to it because it's purely different and beyond even the ability to relate to it. So then theology has this long history of trying to somehow find a middle ground in similarity difference that isn't simultaneously heresy. And I think in a similar way, philosophy has actually started to do that. Like, how could we like maintain difference and uniqueness and everybody, you know, Mr. Ebert and different, how do we even vectors? And so how do we maintain that? But then at the same time, not have them be um, so unable to relate that you can't speak meaningfully about them or can't have a meaningful mechanism of interaction. What does that look like? How do you carry that out? How do you map that out? Those are very difficult thinking. Like in the same way, like trying to map out how um, technology, even when it's not around, when it's absent, is still in, ha, still has an influence on you because it structures the way you think about reality. Like if you're always doing a lap, you know, if you're always using your laptop and you're thinking, say, using hyperlinks and you're going for different things, then you can enter into enter conversations, structuring it just like a program on the internet or switching between topics very quickly. Like I, the obvious example everyone brings up is attention deficit disorder. So even when you're not on the computer, when it's absent, when it's lacking, it's still structuring your thinking in a, in a certain way. And I think that's... Um, that's what a lot of these different fields are trying to explore now, that influence of something that's lacking and yet is present in that absence. It feels, this sounds like horseshoe theory applied to metaphysics. Mm. Like the spectrum of ontology, the spe horseshoe theory is the idea that the left and the right at some point are closer together than uh, the far left and the far right. Mm. They go to such extremes that they become similar. And so this, yeah, this is the first thing that comes to mind, really didn't think too much about it, but pure difference and sameness uh they are the two impossibilities at the edge of the ontological spectrum mm. which maybe is even circular uh and we exist all along the middle ground the temperate goldilocks zone of that spectrum mm. which is uh where things are kind of the same as us but then not really so that there's a little bit of space and leeway for conflict to exist and for some contradictions some contradiction mm. to come up and it feels like it is its management that civilization continually uh reshuffles and remixes and rehashes every few years and uh <clears throat> that's the meaning of the word jubilee in my opinion now that we're talking about theology right what's a jubilee every so often um it's a celebration of some sort of mm, longer year longer period of 25 or 50 years uh but if you look at the discourses of everyday life, uh, we are right now in an era of a delayed jubilee, or rather the previous era is kind of in life support being prolonged for a little bit. I mean, the era of humanism and all of that. Um, and it feels like the next jubilee, the next revolution in terms of the discourses that govern sameness, that govern valuation is overdue. Mm. Um, or maybe... It is up to us to kind of seed the memescape with with its seeds, but uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm just riffing around this this theme of of evolution, revolution, and movement, and the how discourses succeed from one to another and to another and to another. Well, well, I love the word revolution because it's such a funny word because a revolution is a full circle. You get back to where yeah. you start. And yet, so a good revolution actually doesn't complete the revolution. It leaves a little bit of an opening. So the only revolutions that work are kind of failures because, and I think that's interesting because there's something about human beings that we're at, we actually want sameness. Like we talk about like wholeness in a relationship where we're like this, you know, we're the same person in some respects. But then as we talk about with Dr. Last and different things, that's actually like Freud, that's actually a mistake that gets you into a lot of trouble. So then we respond against that with pure difference, which can be more Deleuzian, you know, kind of an essential difference. But then you get to the part where you can't relate as a society because you're too different. So you can have a bounce off of that. But there's something about the brain. The brain does not like complexity, right? In the sense, especially when you talk about like similarity slash difference. What? 
Just tell me if I need to be similar or different. Don't give me that freaking slash crap. I don't want that. Or tell me to be different or tell me to be the same. Don't give me this dialectical tension that I have to actively work on every single day. We do not like that. But of course, the problem is if we actually get what we seem to naturally want, which would be a state of pure difference, being because with pure difference can come a sense of supreme value. I'm the only one like, you know, nothing's even like me. So there's a supreme value you can feel with that. Or you can flip to sameness, which would be like, I'm one with someone. I have this really special relationship to where we're basically the same person. Well, both of those is ironically a kind of death drive. Uh, so you have to have the middle, but then societies have to be organized to manage that natural tendencies of human brain work and let them get close to one, but not so much. And then they have to go back and not so much. Um, a book I really like, which uh, Philip Reef, uh, The Triumph of the Therapeutic, and he was a Freud scholar and really liked um, civilization and discontents. Um, uh, a language that he uses is societies have to um, find a balance between givens and releases. And what a given is kind of a, max, um, a mathematical term, which is a given. Like a given is something that you don't even think about, you just do. So for example, if we go back to a civilization that was purely Christian, you're just, you're just Christian. You don't think about if Christianity is true, it is thoughtless. Now, the key there is thoughtless does not mean stupid. It means something that you kind of absorb just because you're obliged. It becomes a grounding principle of um, rationality. Um, and, uh, and then you see what ends up happening if you don't have enough givens, then you, um, you're more free, you can be more of an individual, but then a problem with that can be you can feel existentially destabilized because you don't have any um, support. You don't have any background support. Uh, so you don't want to have too much given because the other problem is when you have um, too much givens, which we can associate with sameness, you know, everyone's a Christian, everyone has the same thoughtless background that can give rise to what Hannah Arden talked about, the banality of evil, which uh, is where the evil becomes something that you do every single day and you don't even think about it because it's thoughtless and therefore it is not evil. So that's where you get your xenophobia, your racism and all those terrible things. But then if you go in the direction of having no givens, you can have the collapse of your social order, which leads to an existential, um, uh, nobody knows what to do. <laughs> like that's the, you know, what is a male? What is, what are the roles? How, what should we believe in? And there can be this existential destabilization of which can be a negative space for an opportunity for something new, but if it gets too out of hand, the um, internal structure of the society could fall back. And in that state of extreme existential destabilization, totalitarianism becomes appealing because people just want to get back to a sense of stability. So then they turn to the uh, the fascist or the, so they turn to the dictator. So you have to find a middle in, in the same way that we ontologically have to find a balancing act, uh, a dialectical um, act between sameness and pure difference. Sim similarly, the society has to find a balancing act between um, pure pure releases and pure and pure givens. But this is, of course, extremely difficult if the society at large is perhaps not the best at even having a um, discussion, a democratic uh, discussion, because it's uh, because everyone's angry at one another and everyone who disagrees with you is evil. So this is a, or something like that. So well, there's uh, something you, kind of in the um, the difficulty if we're thinking givens as kind of ideological hyper objects, you could have Christian givens like everybody, mm. the son of God or humanist givens like we're all humans and that's the correct category to apply to everyone and liberty and democracy and so forth, which then there's of course the historical circumstances that give birth to these things. And as far as I think the issue we're facing today is that the kind of the hyper objects and the givens of the humanist era that made sense, say, in 18th, 19th century Europe are no longer so coherent today. Sure. It's, it's hard to understand, say, what, <laughs> what democracy would mean when we are hypermediarized, for example, mm. or where the idea of a coherent career projection where you can actually have a sense of what sort of person you are and what sort of person you want to be and actually thus have a sense of, okay, probably these are the sorts of policies that would be good for me in the future. Like, of course, if you choose simple examples, if we're talking public policy, say like I want, well, uh, I don't know. It's, it's hard to even say like, do I want more taxes or less taxes? For example, that is hard to say when you don't know what the fuck the future is going to look like. Okay. Genuine. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Well, the issue is, um, if indeed, like I always, um, 
I, I, if we take like Kurt Gödel's incompleteness theorem correctly, then any system uh, that is 100% coherent uh, couldn't uh, you couldn't determine that it corresponded with reality. But if it corresponds with reality, there has to be an opening in the system. That means it's not completely coherent. So you know any system that humanity has arisen to, whether Christianity, whether it's humanism, or so forth and so on, there should be a expected level of ultimate incompleteness to it. But that here's the key. This is the that incompleteness would not therefore mean it is false. Right. Or that, you know, it's 100 percent false. Maybe it's 90 percent true and 10 percent false. Right. Or, you know, 88 or so on and so forth. Well, the only way to figure that out is to go into every single system and think it through and do the work of then putting them up against another. See, the issue is like it. I think the world today, um, the, the issue is that the stakes are raised. Um, you know, active thinking is now very much required. You know, once you get the tool of the Internet and that can sort of open up the reality that all these different worldview systems or so forth have a particular opening in them. Uh, well, now you know that. So you can't go back to a state where you didn't know that, like the thoughtlessness of the givens. You now know that. So the question is, it's almost like the um, it makes me think of Sot being in nothingness where he's looking through the keyhole, look at the girl changing and then uh, someone catches him and he's like, ah, and he taught he refers to that being pinned down. And he uses that as proof that, you know, you as a subject exist, like other, he's trying to say that, you know, other minds exist because mm -hmm. they're able to catch you doing something you don't do. And you reflect on yourself it has this, I call it the pin down moment. So likewise, what the internet does, it, it kind of pins us all down to see that we have no choice, but to do the work, uh, the work of going through the system, trying and trying to make something new. So there's two ways you respond to that uh, being pinned down. You freak out and go to totalitarianism or you go to some form of extreme. Maybe you kill the guy who caught you looking through the keyhole or, or whatever, or you rise to the occasion and, and do the work and go into the different systems and, and think them through and be a very active thinker. But it, it's, a, it's a very... Um... Oh, we've lost him. Mm -hmm. We've lost him for a bit <clears throat> in the middle of a grid point. With a, with a great three frame. expression, yeah. Let us wait a little bit for him to come back. And you're back. Silly internet. I tell you what. So you know. I, so did You've you get pinned any down? You know, we were all talking about Satra. Okay, so it's like the pin down thing. So with Satra, like it's in the same way that the internet pins you down to realize that. Wait a minute. All of these different worldviews are in fact worldviews. They're not just views of the world. They're, they're structures, they're maps, they're not territories. And so you're kind of pinned down now to respond to that. And there's two ways you respond to being so pinned down. You freak out and turn to totalitarianism, or maybe you're at the keyhole and you turn around and kill the guy who catches you, or you rise to the occasion and do your work to do the work of thinking, right? Or to think through these different things. And then, but then of course, that gets into like, how do you do that work? And that would get into mental models and epistemology and thinking and like acts of judgment or being able to balance things. Or how do you even know if you're reading, say, the authority on um, a certain worldview or subject? How do you, you said there's all these, it unlocks a whole lot of existential tensions uh, that would, that, that are kind of thrown on you, I think, to rise to the, to the challenge, if you will. I think there's maybe a third way to deal with that being pinned down moment. Um, and I, I, I feel like, um, well, the answer to take the, <clears throat> the route of establishing a very well-maintained, hygienic, uh, epistemological field uh, and thinking through all the variables and trying to give a signifier to each of them and then put them in a network that works. I feel like that route, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a bit of me that is like, nah. Because there's this other part of me that is like, uh, well, sure, we could all, we could always uh, go back to that oceanic regressive feeling and uh, simply deliver ourselves to the pleasures of whoever is purveying them to us, uh, the TV, the drugs, the consumerism. But I also feel like it is an impossible intractable, intractable problem to, to solve this being pinned down the problem of the other. And... Uh, Precisely the moments of history, and not to say that these are ideal or are to be desired, but precisely the moments of history where the Jubilee has come about have been moments uh, where somebody uh, gets to a point and, and simply decides not to take society as a metric for good thought. Someone decides not to just say that, well, relating in society is is 
is how we should mediate our pursuits of truth. Because I feel like that's sort of prostituting the great truths uh, to, to bring them into the marketplace of, of man. Um, it's very, very Zarathustra, if you will. But um, I feel like sometimes the most dangerous and hard and even difficult thing to do is to think through what it would mean for society if we think these inconsistencies between one and the other fully, because perhaps the hard realization that we would get there, uh, or we would get to realizations that are rather uh, uncanny, rather hard to deal with, rather violent, rather insane, rather shit, there's no epistemological field that can hold this barrage of cosmic nothingness um, to come to come face to face with the crack in the real, right? And mm. And the fact that it's just, it just making no sense. We're going to die. It's not going to make any sense. It's not going to be complete. Uh, right. And then then that's really the being pinned down, right? By death, the great queen of, of nothingness. And, and in a way, that's liberating. Uh, I'm not saying that it justifies a pure hedonism, that it justifies a pure... Uh, it, it actually justifies the opposite. It justifies that in order to be ethical in such a situation, you would have to... Um, often self-sacrifice in face of certain truths of your own desire. And, and well, I guess what I'm trying to conclude here is that uh, there's some, we there's, there's, there's a wicked Cheshire cat smiling behind, behind whatever we're looking at right now. There's a wickedness of a, a co cosmic horror uh, underlying every aspect of existence, some Cthulhuan thing. And I think that right here, right now, with an incomplete epistemological map, right here, right now, if we are able to smell it out of the cracks and have a little bit of a chessboard with it and throw the dice and do our little thing, then maybe we say when the Jubilee happens. Marvelous. Uh, you know, one of the funny things is... Um, if you actually did read every book in the Library of Babylon, you know, with the boy stories or different things, you see, since you're finite, you would forget which books you read and which ones you yeah. didn't. So you would not actually be able to keep up with your progress. Um, but, you know, a lot of the conflict of mine is about this, um, the tension between the feeling of epistemic responsibility and epistemic possibility. And epistemic just kind of means like the ethics of being a good thinker, right? So, for example, you're like, well, before I make a decision, I should get all the information and I should look into it. So there's a feeling that that is what is epistemically responsible to, to reference Mr. Clifford. The only problem is that uh, it's not possible. <laughs> and so, and also too, thinking actually, um, the, the thinking is in the business of coherence more so than correspondence. It's in the business of rationality more than truth. And that's a distinction we kind of follow through the whole um, series. Uh, it, it's trying to determine what is rational relative to what it is absorbed as being the things that compose uh, the world. And the problem is, uh, you have to use that very brain that is in that business in order to determine um, the correspondence that it's not really that interested in. So there's always going to be a certain doubt about those different things. Um, one of the things, so what's interesting about the internet is the very, it's this kind of double act with a very act of now feeling like you literally could learn everything uh, in that negativity, if you will, unveils that impossibility and thus leaves you with a choice. Um, oh, and I did want to know what you were saying about society. That's like Kierkegaard saying that the problem of Christianity was then uh, it was deciding how Christian it was in terms of Christian dumb. And so, you know, that's where it gets to the existential. And he's like, you know, and that's what you're saying. Like, there is a problem if like the society becomes the standard of values. Uh, but then the risk can be if it if there's no society at all, that could actually contribute to almost a Margaret Thatcher thinking of saying that the individual is all there is, and that could have a unintentional backlash. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, and that's always the problem of incomplete serial systems. They can always have this unintentional backlash, although that's a, a different topic. But anyway, so the internet mm -hmm. says, hey, it's yeah, it has it, the horseshoe. Beautiful. Um, so the internet has this way where it presents you, um, everyone, thousands of years, human beings have known that they, uh, you know, they can't know everything. I mean, it was embedded in the theology, but you kind of had an out because you could say, well, I can't know everything, but God knows everything. And I know God. Ah, mm -hmm. good. So it kind of gave you a little existential relief from the reality. Right. Uh, and rather one believes in God or not. Um, the point is that the reality that you can't know everything and you can't even like come close to it was more abstract. 
Okay. It was just kind of an idea that you knew, but now with the internet, it's almost personally encountering every single day, the feeling that there's a lot to know, but it gives you a feeling that you could do it. If only you would have watched a few more lectures on YouTube, if only you were to read a few more books. So right. it makes you, it makes you feel like you could do it. Well, the problem is then that you can like learn forever and never like take a leap of faith if we're taking that Kierkegaard to commit to anything or sort of jumping on anything, right? Um, and so the question is, do we take the internet as unveiling personally and emotionally the in, um, inability of the human being to know everything and taking that as a negativity to cause a sublimation that has us live a different kind of life as opposed to try to deny um, the very fact that we have a finitude that we can never complete. And we're just going to try to read the library of, of Babylon. But, but that is, but that actually, what's interesting about that, taking that leap of faith I just so described is an emotional reality. Um, it is a personal reality because intellectually following what would be epistemically responsible, then you need to keep reading. Don't stop. Keep going. Your mind is going to say the right thing to do is to keep reading the books in the library of, um, Alex, of, uh, of Babylon or, or what have you. But that's why if we just define the human being as a brain on a stick, you know, not a full body thing, et cetera, so forth, uh, that we're set up to be caught in a conflict of mind uh, between epistemic possibility and epistemic responsibility uh, that we can never escape. And, and it, will have a, it will have an effacement principle to it as opposed to a negation in a Hegelian sense that might open up a, a new po possibility. I like this, and I'd like to spend a little bit of time on that thought because one of the things I've noticed in some of the work I've been doing recently with corporate clients is there's this kind of notion, I think, in the corporate consciousness that there's such a thing as a good decision. And because we now have artificial intelligence, we now have the possibility of finding the science of a good decision and having actually we now have the resources available to make an 100 percent good decision. And of course, there's no philosophy in this thinking. So there's no thinking like, what is the notion of the good or even what is a decision? But it's purely instrumental. It's okay. There's all the data. All we just need is an algorithm that's built smart enough to pull the data and make the decision for us. I find that kind of fascinating. So you're saying this, a sense of epistemic possibility. I think it's blown up right now, perhaps. And this is one of the symptoms of the maybe the death of God or because you said like what the thing that you do in the religious worldview is at least <laughs> God knows everything and I can know God. Well, we can no longer know God and thus it is possible for man to know everything or for man to know everything through his little helper, Mr. AI. Mm. Well, to that point, you see, um, you know, on the idea that you can have an AI, big data, you know, don't worry, guys, we're going to overcome this conflict of mind by simply outsourcing it to the AI, right? Or you'll have something that can do the bad data can sort through and, and so on and so forth. So it's like, <laughs> Daniel, Daniel, just shut up, man. We got this covered. We got our quantum computers coming. They're going to have networks of quantum computers. It's all going to work out great. Uh, and, and so, yeah, that's what they think. But of course, the great problem is um, what you were talking about best decision. Well, the word best necessitates a metric that someone has decided. Unless the computer can program, like, unless the computer is able to determine the very metric, which then sounds like a violation of Girdles, the incompleteness theorem, we've got ourselves a problem. It would seem to have to be someone would have to decide what that metric is. It kind of reminds me, um, you know, I did this paper once on kind of the um, the v, uh, Weber's uh, Protestant work ethic, and there's this idea that, you know, oh, under Calvinism, you know, people wanted to prove that they were saved, even though they couldn't be saved by good works. Um, they uh, they would work really hard to prove that they were one of the elect, you know, that, that, that they could do that. And the argument I try to make is I say, yeah, that, that's part of it. But the other issue is that in Calvinism, you have a doctrine of total depravity that follows with sola scriptura, okay? Sola scriptura, like the Bible alone, right? Where, say, in Catholicism, you have more of a sacramental ontology where there's the book of, there's the book of Revelation and the book of nature. So there's can be a dialectic more so in Catholicism. Whereas in Protestantism, if you have a sola scriptura, um, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be just the Bible. But here's the problem. Um, uh, Cardinal Newman had this great line where he said, words don't tell you what they mean. I always thought that was hilarious. Words don't tell you what they mean. And what he's trying to say is that you have to interpret words. You have to just you have to interpret what the word says and you bring your definition to it and so on and so forth. So the issue is that in Protestantism's um, Protestants um, reading the Bible and believing it was self they didn't interpret it. They just read it. Right. You know, they don't know any um, interpretation is what other people do. We just read. Right. Uh, so, you know, they were just uh, reading the Bible. But the problem is 
They were actually interpreting it, and they, of course, just happened to be interpreting it in line with the zeitgeist of the day, which was capitalism. Uh, because if you don't own the fact you interpret, that there's a human element, you're still going to interpret. You're just not going to know you're doing it, and you're going to do it in line with the system of the day. So here's the problem. In the same way, what ends up happening is we're going to fall into a kind of, I guess I want to call it sola technologica. I think that is the Latin, sola techno, where technology is going to become the metric of doing our thinking. And we're going to just think, oh, we're just read it. You know, this is just what the computer says. But in fact, we're interpreting the metric because the computer itself cannot give us the metric and we're not even going to realize we're doing that. So I can see like, like it's going to be like how you had in Protestantism a sola scriptura that made it susceptible to a delusion capture uh, by sort of capitalism. I think you could have a similar thing happen with AI with a kind of sola, sola technologica. Uh, and that actually I do think can tie um, into, into the ontological design because it's almost like um, if we don't ontologically design ourselves, Follow and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Frega. Um, it, it's it's we're still going to be ontologically designed. The choice is between ontological designing ourselves or being ontologically designed. And in the same way that when we talk about like hermeneutics and interpretation, the choice is either owning the fact that you have to interpret and then learning how to do it well. Say, I just finished this wonderful book series on Hayden White, the historian with David Gosley and John David, and we talked a lot about that. Um, because if you don't own the fact that you're going to interpret and think you're just going to read, you're going to read really bad. You're not going to do a good job. But, but you have to, there's a kind of negation there, right? Because reading feels very empowering. Like it's objective, it's a science, it's like solid, right? But to accept interpretation feels fluffy and subjective in different things. So you may as a human being not want to do that. But if you do not do that, then you're going to interpret poorly and the consequences are going to be very bad. In the same way that with the AI systems to say that there has to be an inevitable human element to determine the metric can kind of feel fluffy and dangerous. And we want to just deny that and say, no, 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 no. The AI is going to take care of all the big data. It's going to solve all these epistemological problems because all the data does is spit out the result. It just quote unquote reads, mm -hmm. it doesn't interpret. So I think you have a similar kind of mistake as I see in um, Weber's Protestant work ethic kind of happening a bit with the um, with the AI. Yeah. What, what you need, you did not see Catholic, and this is a generality, but I think it's quite fair um, because you actually had like the workers movement with Dorothy Day and different things in, uh, in, in Catholicism or the, the Orthodox and different things because they had more of a theology of um, sacramental ontology which means that reasoning was something God could use. Um, then you could have a dialectic between reasoning and the Bible, and that dialectic would make you less susceptible to capture. Now, that's a generality, but, it, you know, so on and so forth. So likewise, a dialectic between the human and the AI or the technology, because we don't want to say, like, technology is bad or good, you know, the, any of those intrinsic valuations is always quite problematic. Wow. Um, but the issue is, any, we, I, think, I think it's a good sort of mental model almost, or a uh, rule of thumb, is whenever a dialectic is missing, you should be you should be skeptical. You should be concerned. Uh, now, a dialectic is not merely a comparison of difference. You can't have a dialectic, say, between the color red and the color yellow because they're too similar. <laughs> you know, a dialectic has to have a sort of ontological kind of level to it, right? The difference of an AI and AI. If we're using uh, Mr. Elong's vector language, you know, there's kind of a there's a big dip. There's a, there's a significant difference between AI and and the human being that can give rise to a real dialectic that can perhaps avoid various forms of capture. Now, what I just laid out right there has a lot of the like, what is a vector? What is it? How would you constitute that? Sense? And I'm more than happy to be here though 10 o'clock there's an ihop that doesn't ever close i could just go over there and we can get into that uh, the coffee's pretty good uh, and i love the uh the, the hash brown smothered all the way you cannot go wrong with those hash brown smothered all the mm. way but but generally i i see that problem with the ai you americans your fast food uh, <laughs> i know right <laughs> forever <laughs> until we don't <laughs> <laughs> well, one day you don't no, it's what just don't. and so many things so many thoughts uh here I want to distinguish, or, or you made me think about the distinction between the discourse of the master and the discourse of the slave, um, mm. meaning that <clears throat> the master will have the discourse that suits his purposes best, and the slave will make sure to run all the circles that they're told to run in order to keep it coherent. Mm. Um, and, and I think that this sort of pushes us into, I cannot help but to have to become of a tactical mind at this point and to start mm. to think about the tactical tactical considerations here because the master or or you know not in in the in the valuation sense of oh, some people are above others but like mm. you know reasoning valuation that is done by its own agent in a way mm. or, or tends to be done by its own agent to, towards the totality is is something that 
exhibits a certain fidelity to one's own desire. And sometimes it's hard to discern what bit of that desire is our own and what bit is uh, from someone else. So sometimes there may be really smart people. And I know a lot of people like that that have like immense IQs that like holy have like really talented, gifted people who seem to lack that moral capacity uh, to perform evaluation themselves. And Mm. therefore, like Owen says, fall back into, oh, the AI told me to, and, or this is what, this is, you know, the best decision is something that the AI or democracy or the science is going to decide. Um, And they say this as an article of faith, as a safe out, as a safe escape from having to think things through. Mm. You don't need to have a, a gifted IQ, but you need to have some sort of moral bravery to think through the fact that these statements of AI will give us the right decision, et cetera. Uh, you need to have that moral bravery to say, well, who says what is better? Uh, society? No, no. Society is a marketplace. Marketplaces fluctuate and their values obviously relate to each other and never to an absolute good. The gold standard is gone in money, and so is the God standard in valuation. And it seems like this floating epistemological field needs to be considered tactically. Uh, And that is, in my view, the right way to approach its higher, more metaphysical questions, which seems like a contradiction. But I think that that's that's where our out is, because it is not like we're going to find the master signifier. Or it is not like we should fight for the master signifier of our own master. But rather, tactically speaking, a master will will tell the story that benefits them the most. And so this this opens like an immense, like if a really great point of view. If I was a technocrat working in Brussels or working for a a big corporation, which I do, so sometimes I actually do say these things, (laughs) I will say... I will say what I like, if it suits me from uh, being faithful to my own desire perspective, then I will say that this AI driven decision is the best scientifically proven, uh, evidenced, uh, trustworthy, better decision, like harder, better, faster, stronger. But I also cynically understand that that is the discourse of the master, which is pure. It's just another discourse. And so, again, this is where tactics comes in. Tactics, uh, the Second Amendment for the mind, the idea that the marketplace or the battlefield of ideas, marketplace and battlefield becoming interchangeable terms nowadays, um, has become ubiquitous. And so how does one exist and relate in it? Not, in my view, through a philosophy of static things, uh, through a philosophy, philosophy obviously, of continuity, continuity and motion, a la Deleuze, but also a philosophy of practice. That's why design, and obviously I'm biased because I'm a designer. So of course, you know, I'm going to say this precisely because I'm going to say what benefits me the most. Uh, Of course, design is the philosophy or the philosophy is one of design, of designing your own position amongst these places and power relations to mediate a relationship to a nothingness that suits you the best, that doesn't suit properness that doesn't suit developedness in the terms of the other but that does it in the terms of the one all always having not rejecting the other completely but but being the sovereign mediator of the relationship with the other uh, and that mediation being done by yourself and not necessarily by some mediator in a white robe, whatever shape that ends up taking. I don't know if I'm making myself clear. No, I just it, it was a ton of wonderful th- you know, if you before I forget, um, we were talking about the fundamental like lack and complete and different things. I think this is why ultimately, like um, perhaps it would be possible to have a quantum computing system that would figure everything out if the world was merely what I like to call the truth, which would alluding to Wittgenstein would be the everything that is the case. The issue is that reality is more of the absolute, which is everything that is the case, plus us plus subjects that are changing what constitutes the change, that are interpreting what is the case. So it's more Hegelian, right? Like absolute knowing. There is a fundamental um, incompleteness in absolute 
absolute nothing, but incompleteness is almost like the I N is in parentheses. It's like incompleteness. Like if you're incompleteness, there is a incompleteness to that of which then feeds itself and keeps it alive. And that's Uh, the most, that incompleteness is the most present thing in the world. I remember being a kid and reading all these new agey things and having like a massive hard time to try and understand like, Oh, but what is, they were like, you have to be nothing or you have to be full and everything at the same time. And I'm like, no, I, I lack a bunch of things. And I'm like here, but I'm not everywhere. I don't have everything. But precisely to articulate it as incompleteness is the most present thing ever. Look around you. You don't see everything. There's a lot of things that you don't have, that you don't do, that are just ontologically not here. Good. Well, you know, Mr. That's Sprague, I, I, I have to tell you that I guess I was like three or four, whatever I was, I had a box of cornflakes and I was sitting on the green carpet upstairs and I was having a complete freak out because I realized I could not look at my own face. This was like, like I could not look at my own face. I was like, I have to look at a mirror, but that's not my face. And it was just devastating. I had my corn pops and I was eating my corn pops like bonbons and soap wow. operas or whatever. And I was like, I can't look at my own face. It will always be like not something I can do. Uh, and, it, and that was really funny for me because it has this sort of like incompleteness wow. embedded into it. Because uh, yeah. I always think about that. You really can't look at your own face, can you? You can only look at it through an object or like a fa- you know a picture or something or some mediator or something oh, like God. that. So We are technological uh, from day zero. Uh, well, it was the corn pops, really. I didn't even have milk, you know, so it really <laughs> felt like lack. It was like huge lack. I don't even milk for these corn pops and then uh, and different things. But, you know, you were saying on choice, master signifier and, and so on and so forth. Mm. Um, one, um, a few things. So one, it brings to mind the unbelievable and extraordinary Grand Inquisitor section of Dostoevsky where, you know, Jesus comes back and the Grand Inquisitor gets him up and he's like, you know, Jesus, I tell you what, we're going to kill you tomorrow because, you know, we um, you know what? You gave human beings freedom. Free will. That's why evil exists because of free will. Because, you know, Alyosha and Ivan have this discussion and Ivan's like, you know, why do all these kids die? And uh, Alyosha's like, well, because, you know, God lets us have free will. And Ivan Karmosov is like, I'm turning my ticket back in because this sucks. I rather not have free will. I rather be a freaking robot uh, than uh, than let bad stuff happen. And the whole Grand Inquisitor is basically a giant critique. It's like, Jesus, we're going to kill you because human beings don't want freedom. They want mystery. They want freaking miracles and they want food. That's what they want. And you gave us freedom. What the heck are you doing? Uh, so we're going to kill them. And so that whole notion, I think, is exactly right. We're always looking for a master signifier because then it's this lovely thing where we can say, well, we're going to let we're going to do what that thing says or what the computer says or whatever. And it's not our fault. But look how humble we are. That's why it's so tempting, because it actually kind of brings itself in a sort of humble way. It presents itself as a sort of like you're a moral person because you're just doing what the, uh, you know, the computer says you're bowing down to it. But actually, it's secretly hiding an act of running from responsibility. It's running from being target. In a sense, what does responsibility do? If you are responsible for something, you are someone people can point at. You know, they can point at you. They can say, you did this. Now, we love to be responsible when stuff goes well. We love to be you know, responsible when the corporation has a 20% increase in its profits or whatever. No, nah, that, you know, when you're a free society, you get, mm, sorry, you tend to be responsible for the good and the bad. And actually human, the key that we kind of forget is that the majority of human life is in fact failure. Uh, like if you're, like you're gonna be failing a lot more than you're gonna be succeeding. Uh, And so responsibility as a kind of metaphysical principle is going to have you facing lack, if you will, a lot more than a doctrine of looking for something to solve all the problems or whatever, right? Because the other thing too is you're like, well, of course we're screwing up because we don't have the master signifier yet, but we're going to get it. We're going to get it. And that in in its own right kind of absolves you of responsibility, right? Because you can say that we don't have this thing. There is absolutely something in the human psyche that that is captured so well by Dostoevsky um, there. We we don't want freedom. We want... um, we want freedom in so much as we can do what we want to do. That's what we mean by freedom. Like this, so I freedom, I want to be free, meaning I can eat, uh, you know, corn pops whenever I want or something. But freedom, meaning you stand out, you are responsible for how these things go. No, we don't want that. We don't. There's want also we, kind of, sorry, did I cut you off? No, 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 no. The, 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 so there's also <laughs> something in this in terms of how we as particular historical subjects are thinking about the process of history. Because there's kind of, easy to forget that we kind of unconsciously accept the the weak conception of history that everything is changing and everything is getting better which is only what like a few hundred years old whereas probably if you go back a thousand years or or two thousand years we're thinking 
stuff is basically like this. This is basically the way the thing goes. And so the master signifiers are, can kind of be static, especially say I'm part of the Roman elite or the Italian elite. It's basically I'm going to do, going to be virtuous. I can be responsible. I kind of know what that means. And as long as I kind of stick to that, then hopefully things don't fall apart. We've completely shifted that now, both in terms of how we think about history, in terms of everything is changing and necessarily has to change if we're not being ethical subjects, but also our technology reflects that. And of course, there's the question of to what degree the ideology kind of exists in symbiosis with the thing. But the point I'm getting at is like, we're only we're playing a very different game in terms of the types of master signifiers that we seek. And perhaps this is the thing that even Dostoevsky is kind of intuiting when he's playing with that in this kind of, our notions of freedom are much more, um, that's kind of a hot topic t- today in, in the Whig history conception. Freedom is much more kind of radical and makes less sense when you're a Roman elite trying to hold the whole thing together. Sure. We're no longer perceiving ourselves as people trying to hold a thing together. We're perceiving ourselves as people trying to make a thing much better. Mm. Oh, yes. And, and it becomes especially problematic if we don't even agree on what the thing is uh, or like the terms of the thing are different things because you have the collapse of givens or people living in different worldviews and so on and so forth. Uh, and, but then right. course- and our givens then become processes rather than, rather than statics. So but our givens it, it, become it, democracy. They become AI rather than virtue and responsibility. And you see, the key there is the problem is arguably virtue and responsibility entail a kind of process because you're always not living up to the idea, but you're trying to get better. Right. So the problem is, it's almost like um, in my view, if you took, you know, we talked about the pinning down of the Internet and so on and so forth. And what how do you respond to that? Well, uh, there's a lot to say of it. Hopefully reconstructing ASA accomplishes this. But to, you know, cut to the chase, that should suggest that you ontologically see yourself as something more process based and something that is more seeking an absolute as opposed to a truth. Right. So active thinking process, absolute versus truth, if you, you know, all those languages and that also accepts the inevitable conflict of mind uh, situation that arises on what uh, David Hume calls autonomous rationality, which is trying to have rationality that is purely rationality without any ascription to a external truth, which of course is impossible when you have a negation, so on and so forth. Well, we didn't do that. Instead, we're just saying, well, we're going to put the process in technology. We're going to make the process external to us. Um, and that's where we're going to place the process. So we're still almost, um, we're still finding loopholes before we, like, you know, we're still, like, we're still really pushing off the inevitable acceptance of individual process that we should accept in order to kind of move forward in a good way, not necessarily a progressive way, but in a manner that uh, I suppose would say humans rise to the occasion of themselves, right? But we're not going to do that yet. No, 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 no. We're going to we're going to put it on the process of the AI or the process of society, or yeah. the process of economics. And you know, a hellish way to do that, but which often comes to mind is what uh, in Crime and Punishment, I think it's Raskolnikov he tries to do, mm. which is, uh, okay, I'm going to kill because I'm not most humans, because I make my own valuation, because I am a master of my own values, at least, even though... You know, probably because I'm frustrated because I'm not uh, Napoleon and I haven't ach- achieved that much with my life. Therefore, I will at least have this measure of power. And I will slay somebody and then someone else by mistake. Uh, and that consumes him. But at least in the in the effort and in, in, in the whole trip and uh, accompanying the whole trip of the man, there's something there's something interesting in it, which is like. It is the rebellion against the should uh, yes. of the proper process uh, and in a way simultaneously being extremely faithful to its own self-process. Who says that a murderer cannot be ethical, though he is immoral? Uh, and this is a dark truth, but I cannot help sometimes but to bring about these edge cases because these edge cases kind of help and prevent me from saying, oh, if we all did our homework, everybody would be, well, because I don't believe that. Uh, I, the utter incompleteness of reality somehow doesn't allow us that. And so it follows naturally that, have you really considered yourself slaying someone? Uh, what would that mean? What does that mean for the real deep fabric of reality? Because in one way or another, we're not that pure difference, right? We're we're always like 
in a place in a time and we we love our structures and we need them and we, we all do but sometimes what would that mean and 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 what would that mean for also like the self uh, for the development of one's of one's I don't know of one's place in the world. It's really weird. I, I don't know. I think I'm rambling a little bit, especially because, because this is also like a habit that I that I that I usually like to do, which is like a, think the disaster, think through the disaster and the evil instead of like immediately recoiling to a place of uh, to, to a safe conclusion. I don't know. What does the, what does this make you think of? Not, hey man, you know, Christianity puts the cross right at the center of it. So disaster is pretty important or it puts the fall right at the beginning of it. So, you yeah, know, unless you, fall. what's that now? But it's his fall. Oh, uh, God's fall. Yeah. What if the real God is Satan? He took the fucking fall and he took no credit for it. Well, you know, for who would lose so full of pain, these intellectual beings, those thoughts that wandered through eternity to perish rather swallowed up and lost in that wide womb of uncreated and Satan. And then we're going to rebel against God and sort of take that place in paradise lost. That's one of my favorite sections. So, uh, mm. you know, for who would lose so full of pain? Uh, but, you know, what's funny is, um, you know, J.K. Chesterton did have that line, you know, just to riff a little of what you're saying, where on the cross, Jesus became an atheist. Right. You know, right. And, and Isaac kind of plays on that. And there is, in fact, there is um, Christians actually don't see it. And sometimes it does take outside religion, say Islam. Of, you know, in the Sufism will play on this is the idea that no, no, man, it's kind of really heretical to suggest that God can in incarnate into the world. Like what God exactly is, is um, radically different. If you're saying, say in Dante, you have the human effigy in the circle in the circle, and there's something central about human beings that God is inviting to some sort of dance. Um, I mean, in another way, you, it's, it's important to remember that the, when, when Jesus is, um, you know, crucified, uh, the Sachetes and the Pharisees, they have really good reason to do it. Because according to their principles, he has, in fact, committed heresy. He has, in fact, suggested that he can forgive sin, which would be an act of claiming that he's God. So this principle of sort of these important inversions, if you will, or these sort of thinking of these possibilities, so I think if, is really important. And if God broke the law there, mm -hmm. why can't we think that he broke the law at a bigger scale? So if he incarnated and he broke the law by going into the temple and fucking shit up, why cannot we think about Whole, the whole existence as a, as a sin unto itself uh, and then interpret self-sacrifice as him being co-simultaneous with Satan, but somehow taking the flack as Satan for, for the lack of, of, of the project of existence, for its failure, for its contradictions, right? The snake takes the flack. Isn't that more Christian? Doesn't he have any friends? Uh, my point is, 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 is to think to what extent is there a master's discourse behind this from a tactical perspective, but a self-sacrificing master, one that is that tells a narrative for the good of his people and takes the flag inside. But, um, I mean, I think like Zizek's point, right, is that Jesus on the cross kills the master's discourse. Mm -hmm. There is no longer any authentic master's discourse possible by Jesus on the cross. And one of the interesting things is that Gerard's notion of Christianity kind of corroborates with that. Like his basic idea is that Christ means that there is no legitimate reason for a group of people to kill someone else, mm. for a big group of people to thus kind of have an ideological motivation for killing. So if we run with this, the Christian revelation is that there is no master anymore. Mm -hmm. Deal with it. Mm -hmm. And that's the greatest master's discourse of all, dialectically or weirdly, right? There is no master, and this is your master. This is your new master. Jesus was the first pomo, but really, <laughs> right. yeah, he yeah. was. <laughs> but the, yeah. honestly, these reversals of places uh, are, in my in my view, like like isn't isn't crime and punishment such a tremendous lesson? Isn't the fall? Uh, from Eden, for example, such a great lesson, or or maybe it's not that much of a, more mysterious than a lesson, but I don't know. The it feels like it would take some sort of self sacrifice to put yourself in the place of that uh, uh, of that demon, and sometimes for us to really think that through. 
but also requires some sort of self-sacrifice. Hey man, I think it is um, um, Sufism, you know. Some some of the Sufi, organ, you know, will uh, they'll worship Iblis, which would be the equivalent of Satan in Christianity as kind of the highest prophet, because while all the angels bow down to Adam and, um, you know, Adam and Eve were just Adam at the time, Iblis would not. So he's the true monotheist, right? He's the mm-hmm. true believer, while everyone else was willing to bow down. So there's this mm-hmm. idea that Iblis is actually the greatest believer of God, precisely in this act of denying what God says. And if um, we... Int- <sighs> Sorry, just very quickly. And if we, I just remembered that if we look at angels as churches of perception or semi creatures that rule our perception, then precisely the one that doesn't bow to man, the one that man cannot conceptualize in his own mind, is the absence, is the crack in the reel, is uh, the devil or the god or that, the incompleteness of the real. Mm-hmm. Man's mm-hmm. real is composed of all the angels that, bow, that bowed down to him. And then there's the other. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, you know, there's a lot of different things. Um, um, so first off, uh, one, if if it is actually sensible following a more Jewish theology to view Jesus as a heretic and to kill him, that would suggest that theology has a fundamental incompleteness to it because you're not open to something different that may occur. And actually, in a sense, because you're following that master signifier of that theology, uh, you know, you're participating in a mistake while simultaneously not participating in a mistake because it's all relative to your structure. So there's right there is an un, um Right there is a revelation of the problem of finitude. And also, and I wanted to to, to describe this, is it also speaks to where there is a dialectic between thinking and action. And you were talking about sitting around and doing your homework and and different things. Like if homework does not become action, well, then we've got a problem. You're probably going to fall into coherence and not have any correspondence. But then if you just have correspondence, but you don't do any mental work, how can you know you're corresponding with something you want to correspond with, right? So there has to be a dialectic between um, action and thinking. And arguably... Um, the problem with the internet is it almost makes it so easy just to go in the direction of thinking, if you just take that as a general term, that you don't get enough action, you don't get enough commitment. And also when Owen was talking about virtue, you know, virtue is not simply thinking about being honest. It's when you really want to lie, not lying, for example, or having the discernment um, to tell that, well, if the Nazis break into my house and they're asking where the Jews are. So this is an allusion to Kant. You see, um, they actually aren't worthy. They're not up to the moral statutes of receiving the truth. And in fact, I have more of a moral obligation to the people that are hiding. So I'm not going to give them the truth. Uh, in fact, actually, technically, I don't know if they're still uh, under the floorboards because they may have moved by now. So I'm going to tell the Nazis they don't know because technically I don't. So virtue would also be the ability to see, uh, I almost want to say exceptions, but it's not really exception because they're not like the Nazis, when they ask for where the Jews are under the floorboard, they're not actually worthy of the truth in that circumstance because the ends that they want to use it for are bad. So virtue has a kind of reasoning, but it's also an action. You know, when you are faced with the Nazis and you're hiding, you know, the people who are hiding from the Nazis in your house to be able to discern how to implement that. So it's action and thought together, but it's also not just merely thinking. So virtue as process inherently entails a kind of action. But if you're simply trying to create the AI process that's going to solve the world, well, there's still the action of making the AI, but not in your personal life so much, right? You know, all of the action is put in the designing of the AI, which of course design is good, but but when designing is purely external and there's no ontological design, if you will, to use your term, Mr. Frega, then we're doing a lot of, um, the all of the design is external from our own life. It's projected outward onto things as a way also to escape ourselves. Right. Uh, because we're going to design something that's going to be the master signifier and then we're going to we're going to be free to go. I also wanted to note very critically mm-hmm. to put the um, impetus on this process and action, which gets into like Marcel Blondet or different things. It's really, really important. It's actually a misnomer, I think, to call uh, Michelle and I had to talk on this to call in the Bible. We talked about Eden and we talked about the forbidden fruit. It's actually kind of a mistake. It's more like the forbidden bite. You know, they weren't allowed to say sleep under the tree, touch the fruit. The idea is that you can't bite the fruit. There was an action that was the original transaction. It's it's not actually that the apple itself seems to have had an ontological evil or something like that. It was that when it is not properly ordered uh, for whatever reason that God had, and we kind of talk about that where the, the knowledge of good and evil, you know, if you, you get that, but you maybe not have risen to the occasion yet, were you able to handle that knowledge? You know, maybe God ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because the tree itself was not bad and God indeed have a knowledge of good and evil, but it was not something that in a certain context humans could have. So there's an action that is because also the other point is if you know God on the seventh day of creation, he says very good when at that point in the Genesis he's called Lord God. Well, wait a minute, if the tree and fruit themselves were like innately evil, 
then how could he say everything in creation is very good or that everything is good, right? You know, there was a certain action that then disordered something. And I think very often in the world today, it's trying to figure out the right order uh, between thinking and action, using the internet and committing to something uh, beyond just endlessly reading books in the by the uh, Library of Babylon or, th mm -hmm. or things like that. So finding that um, that split. The last thing I'll say on Rokos, on crime and punishment, you know, he has this idea that if he goes and kills the old woman at, at the pawn shop dealer, I think he's kind of like, oh, well, if I do that, then, uh, you know, I'm not going to feel guilt for it afterwards and thus prove I'm the kind of Superman. It's not Nietzsche, but it's kind of like I'll show that. up. But he has to do the thing in order to find out if he's actually able to rise over the occasion. Uh, but then once he does it, it's kind of too late, right? You know, he can't go back anymore and he's stuck in it himself. There's even the part in the book where someone confesses to the crime he did. So he's like off hook. He can just like get away with it. And yet he himself kind of eats himself alive in different things because there's still at play, you know, what Dostoevsky is trying to say is that there's still some sort of truth in the human being that even if everything in reality uh, suggests they don't have to ascribe to that truth. They can't help on an emotional level um, do that, but but to kind of do ascribe to it. In a similar way, um, you know, once we make, say, if we outsource uh, all of our processes to the uh, quantum computers or different things like that, it might be too late. Once you make that master signify, you might not be able to go back. Mm -hmm. And if there's some human truth inside of us that then we're going to feel that we left unaddressed, uh, well, we're stuck feeling like it's left unaddressed unless we destroy the master signifier, which at that point, the entire society might be designed about the quantum computing and that might be quite difficult. And I think if I were to go on a limb, I think this part in us that um, that does need to be addressed does get into some of you know, the work like with the men's group of Owen Codd that you all have done and different things with the virtue and these doing this, that there's something in human beings that we need to, and to use your phrase again, Mr. Frega, that we have to ontologically design, not just let be ontologically designed. And if we keep going down this path, if we use crime and punishment as a guide, we may get to a place where we've outsourced all of our ontological design to something external that then ontologically designs us, and then we're going to feel it. And then we're going to be kind of trapped, just like Rakoff in the whole novel then follows how he responds to being sort of trapped in this feeling. Hmm. There's a great interplay, isn't there, between the action and the, did you said something about the coherence and correspondence, which I find mm. very interesting. Um, Because the very, it, it's interesting that in the case of Eve, she had to take the bites and the action that disordered the world. Mm. Whereas in our world, there's no action required for it to be disordered. Or maybe that action mm. is mere uh, being born and growing and existing. Um, so it feels like that's a great story for the origin, the original act of, of facing incompleteness. That's why it's, well, one time I was extremely high in ketamine and I realized that Eden is a constant story outside of space time that is constantly happening. It didn't happen mm. way back in the past or in the future. Mm. It's just like always happening. Right. And it refers to this idea that the incompleteness is everywhere. And the story is a great way to refer to that incompleteness, the incompleteness that ate Raskolnikov from inside out. It was that little, you know, within his square of set truths that he was of set values that, that he aspired to, there was an incompleteness that chewed it up from the inside. Right. Uh, Yeah, and arguably part of it, too, is because instead of facing the other, uh, and because he's kind of like he, um, a lot of our cost, I can never say his name, Mr. R, if you will, uh, you know, he's, um, he's facing a feeling of inadequacy, he's stuck in his room, he doesn't leave the room, I think he lost it, maybe he lost his job, it's almost like the beginning of metamorphosis almost with Kafka or something like that, uh, you know, but he doesn't have to go work finally because he's a beetle thing, uh, a little different, uh, which is quite funny, That's, there's a lot actually there, uh, but with um, so he's like, no, I'm I'm really something, dang it. You know, he's kind of acting out of uh, insecurity, 
in some respects. He's acting out as, well, I'm going to prove that I'm really something by killing this person. But you see, the thing is, killing someone is not facing someone. You're just removing the other. And really, what a lot of Dostoevsky wants to get at is because also in the Brothers Karmosov, he talks about this through the idiot, through, um, you know, crime, but his short, I think, The Dream of the Ridiculous Man. Um, there's this idea, there's this great part in the, with Father Zosima, sexual one, um, where someone comes up to Father Zosima and he says, um, um, you know, I confess my sin, Father Zosima. I came to love humanity at the expense of being able to love an individual. You know, I came to love humanity and lost the ability to love an individual. And it was this idea that humanity became this, uh, it's very easy to love humanity and it's very hard to love individuals. And, you know, Dostoevsky is also critiquing some of the Marxist thought that's going on where, you know, there's this, not, you know, that the economic system of Marxism is an entirely different subject, but there's something about human, we love humanity. We all love humanity, but when it comes to your, like, you know, the neighbor that coughs or that, you know, eats their food with their mouth open, nah, forget that. I mean, we don't like that. But that's also the difference between idea and action, right? You know, to love an individual, you have to go see them and act. But humanity, I could just sit here and think about how great humanity is, right? Uh, that that would also, you were speaking about uh, foundations of community, society, you were talking about society as the foundation of value. One of the, it, um, uh, it's a different thing. It's almost like what's happened is you have society, community, family, individual. Um, and you see now our standard of value is the society, is the society, which is almost the most abstract from us. And therefore, you know, it's not necessarily the immediate relationships that would have a standard of value that we participate in. And that actually can existentially be demanding of us, but I'm going to put that over here. That gets into like Robert Buckman, bowling alone, the loss of social capital and different things. But to stick to what I was saying um, is that, it's easy to love humanity and not to love um, a an individual. And so Rakoff, the problem with Rakoff is um, out of insecurity, rather than face the other, because just like in Satra, the other really makes you feel your insecurity and not running from that. And thus your incompleteness, like face your incompleteness. The problem with Raskolnikov is he doesn't act that seems like he's facing his incompleteness, but actually he's running from it. And then in that act of trying to run from it, he realizes he can't escape from it. Uh, and that he's like running for something he cannot escape. So it becomes a negative reaction. And then he kind of mentally breaks down. Whereas instead, the correct response would be something like Alyosha in book four or five or of where at with of the with um with uh, where after Father Zosima dies. You know, spoilers for 200 year old literature, everyone. Very sorry about that. 100 years. So very sorry. I've ruined the Brothers Garmoza. Um, you know, Father Zosima dies and his body starts to stink. And, you know, the saints are not supposed to stink. So everyone's like, well, he must have been a bad person because, you know, everyone thought Father Zosima is the great person. They all think he's fantastic, but he's his body smells. And an Orthodox think it, you know, if your body starts to smell, that means you are actually a sinner. You know, like if you go into Teresa of Avila, just St. John of the Cross, they talk about the body not decomposing and so on and so forth. So Alyosha has a, like a crisis of faith, basically. He goes off and he failed with... Um, he goes off with Radican, I think is the name of the character. And he basically, he goes, he re-participates in the temptations of Christ, the three temptations of Christ and fails, fails miserably um, because he's running from facing that. Because the thing is, Aliosa had tied his identity so closely to Father Zosima uh, that he himself had never faced himself, actually. He was using Father Zosima to run. And so then when Father Zosima could not support his self-image, he ran from him. But Alyosha came back. And then in the chapter, I think it's called The, the Seed of Gadley, he comes back to the monastery and he kind of has a new life because he faces his, his uh, fundamental incompleteness. So that's an example of facing the situation as opposed to trying to erase the situation to prove yourself. And so Alyosha in that situation would be the um, the uh, doing what Rakos is, is doing what Rakos, I can never say his name. What Mr. R should have done. done, but didn't run because R ran from incompleteness in the very act of saying, I'm going to prove my completeness, whereas Alyosha eventually fa faced his own finitude. Yeah, I think, yeah, you, you're making me think there. You perhaps you got a point there in that uh, facing the incompleteness um, might mean a measure of self-sacrifice, of accommodating the other um, and relating to the other. Uh, which again, just makes the myth of self-sacrifice and uh, voluntary self-sacrifice something meaningful um, and interesting to, to consider as well.
No, I think a good example. I can't help but bring it. I'm, 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 I'm a master at interrupting, so please forgive me. Uh, but you know, it's like last night when you go to the grocery store and your aunt Michelle asks you, you know, can you get up the uh, half and half, and you forget the half and half, uh, and you come home. You know, why is it your natural tendency to go? Well, I was just busy. Okay, you know, why is it rather than say I made a mistake, you naturally will come up with excuses for why it's okay that you forgot the half and half, right? But if I'm talking to you guys, it's real easy to say, oh yeah, I'm old. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. You know, in an impersonal intellectual context, acknowledging our finitude and our incompleteness can be quite easy. Uh, or it can be, it, since it fits into like a philosophical system, it even can be kind of, uh, you know, it can be justified and, and part of the, the journey. But when you get into the lived experience of actually in front of someone, uh, you know, admitting that you were wrong or say in sport, this is where sports can be really good. I did wrestling for eight years. You get the crap beat out of you and wrestling it's you, man. <laughs> you know, you're out there. Everyone sees it. You have to face your own failure to have trained as much. But, so that but, brings it to an emotional level. That's very important. But conversely, there's also the place where you can imagine um, people preaching self-sacrifice towards the other as a tool for domination. Oh, yes. And Absolutely. the ethical thing to do would be to kill the other. And yes. let, let's make no mistake. I mean, uh, Raskolnikov's uh reasoning for killing that lady and i mean there's there's his example but but there's perhaps others that we could fashion um they might even you know though immoral they might have been ethical um is is self-sacrifice towards the other always uh, an accommodation of the other always the answer that helps us face ourselves or is there a higher order facing of oneself that <clears throat> requires other types of actions? Don't, oh, we all, don't we all come back to that, to that situation that we discussed in the beginning of, of mediating ourselves and our values through what society deems proper. Should we always do that? Or may we, are we able to consider situations where to do precisely what is a social is the most, ethical thing to do without fear that society will crumble from us. And if, and even if it does, and even if it does, what if that's the ethical thing to do? Oh no, outstanding. Um, I mean, it, it's hard to uh, rather one thinks Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged is really bad fiction or excellent or the greatest book ever read. I think it is very difficult not to take seriously some of the warnings he has of how altruism, guilt, all these different things could be used to control people. Uh, mm -hmm. This woman did, uh, again, I think it's very easy uh, for people to bash on Rand, but this woman grows up. I think the school, she, her first novel was left in a school that got bombed. I mean, her dad had the job taken from her. She, you know, she was quite, she had personally experienced how doctrines of socialism and so on could be used uh, to control people and self-sacrifice. And in fact, Dostoevsky is big on that as well, because he wants to compare the self-sacrifice, like a lot of the Brothers Karamosov is a comparison of the self-sacrifice of the Christian versus the social self-sacrifice that tends to be in service of power in uh, utopian projects. Now, of course, we learned from Kierkegaard that Christianity itself can become a Christian dumb that then leads to projects of power and self-sacrifice for the king and so on and so on and so forth. That, I think, gets into this problem that we're describing between if I'm, I'm just um, the difference between oh, it's almost a difference between ego sacrifice, self-sacrifice and sacrifice of yourself for the state or something like these bigger systems like ego sacrifice does seem to be quite important very often because you feel that not wanting to admit you're wrong, that desire to seek a master signifier, that desire to identify yourself with your work so that you can get status, you know, that sort of going through. Um, you know, the original understanding of the purgatorio, purgatory, like the pain of that so you can get that out of you and not um, put too much on your ego. That seems to be a very necessary function. And it seems to be the case that some acts of self-sacrifice, say going over to your neighbor and um, your, maybe your neighbor's a 60 year old, a 70 year old needs help fi fi fixing lunch. It would seem that some acts of self-sacrifice can also be acts of ego sacrifice. Of course, today it can be more problematic because you take an Instagram picture of you doing that and actually it boosts your ego. So it becomes complexified. Um, also too, if the state is say telling you that um, you know the moral thing to do is to do whatever Hitler says or whatever, and you self-sacrifice yourself to the calls of Hitler, uh, well, you're not necessarily 
facing your ego because your neighbors are also giving themselves to the war effort of Hitler or the economy. So they think you're a great person because you're doing the same thing that they're doing. So there's a self-act sacrifice going on, but it's not an ego sacrifice if I were to come up with those terms. Uh, so it's certainly the case that we can't simply um, assume that self-sacrifice is going to entail a, um, a, a self-negation of the ego that would lead to some sort of sublimation. Uh, so it's not, it's certainly not so simple. Uh, but that of course gets back to what we've been saying of where you have to be a active thinker because, because basically what we've done for a very long time. Um, so for a very long time, we're like, uh, you, you know, it, it's like you, we think we can find the solution in the opposite. I suppose if the problem is selfishness, well, then the, the answer is selflessness, right? And then we're done. But of course, the problem is who defines what selfless is, and it's only a matter of time before it's captured in a manner that's ego supporting, right? So, so, but then you can react and just go back to selfishness, and that's a problem because both of those can form different, if I, you know, co coherent systems or uh, master signifiers or different things. The name of the game is to always have this active process, dialectical, uh, between the two where you're always catching yourself, where you're going, but that requires an active mind. We say, well, you're asking yourself as you walk next door, for example, uh, to help your neighbor fix lunch, you actively ask yourself, why am I doing this? Am I doing it because my mom is guilting me to do it? Or am I doing it because I really actually see value in this life and I see something important in this person, not in me doing this, but in me putting myself in the presence of this neighbor because they have stories to tell that their life matters. And that's why I'm doing it. But, but that sort of analyzation of one's motives is a lot of active thinking and arguably one would need training to really go through their motives. And then of course, at the end of the day, it's probably an acetone line because we're always creatures of self-deception and we may never be able to fully do it, but then, you know, we need to fail better, right? You this know, how can we fail better? There's an element of having to feel both motives at the same time and doing it anyway. And then mm. if necessary, going through the torch of consciousness. This is something I've been through recently. I did something kind of dishonest and now it's like, it's eating me inside. And there's the element of like, Okay, do I just double down on it because it makes it easier for everybody, or do I fucking bring it out? And it, I haven't figured it out yet. But there's that kind of inner yes, torture. Yes. This is the position of Raskolnikov that yes. is the kind of fascinating place to be. And I guess what's what's beautiful in that narrative is the way that he's able to eventually kind of attain some kind of redemption with that figure. I forget her name, but the prostitute, the young girl. Yeah, Sophie, Sophia, it starts Sophia, with Sophia, I think. Yeah, some like, yes. And there's some kind of beauty in the way that it's through him being in this space of inner terminal moil that then allows him to be in relationship with someone else who's an outcast of society, someone else who is sorted with, thrown away. And there's some kind of something in the in the humanizing process if we're kind of being Christians here and going with sure. the Christian heritage, just like learning to forgive one has to embrace the sinner within oneself and really be in that and not be in this state of being the master signifier and having everything, everything worked out. So Skolnikov did, it, did what he had to do. Did he did he? what he thought he had to do and then he suffered for it as well. And that's kind of the... He paid for it, there's no free lunch, but in many ways, uh, yeah, I mean, that's what we're here for. As you were talking, and what came to my mind is like that's what we're kind of here for. To go through the ropes of figuring it out, what it what 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 is for us the right way to act, to do, uh, as we are split between this love of one and this love of other, and the different cases of relationship that you could have with one or the other. And we're kind of this fucking highway interchange that you can go in different directions with each. And there's like a little little connection between both and we're kind of yeah cast between one and the other in the middle and it is it is not going to get solved when we move towards the ages of ai it's just like new year new problems um new new kinds of um same conflicts right it's going to be the the the, the conflicts are going to like take a little dialectical transformation metamorphosis but you know, they're going to have different means. They're going to unfold in different places because the old places have already been sort of saturated. But I see no escape. Even on the day we die, we're going to be incomplete. 
Well, I, to, to your point, you know, basically, Dulce- especially with Alyosha, it's like Alyosha could not really have entered into um, his quote unquote mid call what he was supposed to do until he fell, until he had that disappointment in Father Zosima. I mean, you know, Jesus is like, I come for the sick, dang it. I, you know, there is absolutely, um, I mean, it's crazy, right? I mean, if we follow the Second Testament, I mean, it's like uh, the tax collectors, the, 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 the prostitutes, and different people, those are like the true followers were the most. Um, Leaders, the religious leaders of the day are the are the enemies, right? There is a very important inversion. There is certainly some sort of notion, um, and I think you see this in a lot of religion. There is some sort of notion that until you're the prodigal son and you leave the mansion and you do something almost stupid or something sinful or bad, then you can't enter into the next phase. Um, that's also kind of the message of Dante. Is you gotta the only way to get to Beatrix is to go through hell. You're stuck in this mid, you know, he gets stuck. It starts off, he's in this dark wood at Midlife's oh, Passage yeah. or something. And the only way to get out of the dark wood, because he's got the sea wolf that I guess represents lust, he's got the three animals. The only way to progress, the only way to get forward is to go through hell and purgatory and then to get yeah, up to paradise. It's to bring you not peace but the sword, right? Yes, there, there is the the crate, the critical constant back and forth between peace, battle, sin, holiness, all of these things are a very important element of the development because that's what it seems to be with human beings. It is indeed the case that the great interesting dimension of crime and punishment is precisely that he he is trying to, in a sense, um, overcome his ego or overcome, like kind of rise to the cake. He feels inadequate. Uh, he feels like he's not up and he wants to prove that he is. At the end of the novel, he does. You know, in Dostoevsky, he kind of gets saved. He has this vision of this plague that represents sin, but he becomes a Christian. Now, we don't have to agree with that conclusion, but the idea of him becoming a Christian or being saved is basically that he gets that self-sufficient. He gets that, that he goes through the murder. Maybe he could have gone a different way, um, you know, but the murder is used in a manner that gets him to achieve the very goal that he did the murder to achieve, if that if that makes sense. And so yeah. it's certainly used. And it, it, I guess... Is it the end of Genesis where it's that idea that, you know, where um, he's thrown into the well, they take the, the, the multicolored coat and his brothers and different things. And he goes through all this horrible stuff, but then he becomes like he's leading Egypt and they have um, Joseph and they uh, they they have a, uh, a plague and they survive. And he tells his brothers who threw him in the well, is he, you know, y'all meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And so something evil is then boom, a negativity is taken in a manner that can be then used for good. I think that's true to life. Yeah, um, I think, totally. you know, you know, there's something about the negative that actually has a critical role for uh, for the development. It completely is. And that's the weird, that's the sort of the very horrible dark realization that I was referring to a while ago that sometimes um, you have to, you have, there's no other way. And that's kind of the, the tragedy of incarnation. There's many, and there's many mm. beauties of it, but one of them is that, is the necessity, absolute necessity of of the tragedy uh, for the unfoldment of of oneself. Uh, you could almost say that ontological design is the strategic art architecture of disasters, or it could be. I mean, it's a matter. It's it's an empty signifier. So you could say it could be anything you want it to be. But one of the things it could be is like you just put a fuckload of the, education is this look at tests look at failing look at passing look at martial arts but like you could say that it is this uh, creative practice of putting a person of throwing a lot of disasters in front of a person uh just so that there's a certain development even though you are risking the person not passing them which is again dark 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 and this utter darkness and this utter like holy shit is that like this universal cosmic darkness is perhaps the tragedy that facilitates existence itself again we come back to the beginning that that which is not underpins everything which is Well, you know, it's funny, I, before I forget, there's also a kind of image to that where, you know, if Jesus is born, you know, the first people that show up when Jesus is born is the shepherds, right? Not the kings, the shepherds. We forget that the shepherds of the day tended to be the criminals, the outcasts, the murderers, the people put on the outside. That's why they were shepherds. So likewise, when Jesus is like, he's the good shepherd, it's basically probably the equivalent of saying like, he's the good murderer or say it would make totally no sense. What the heck is going on? Because shepherds were outcasts of society. And what's really interesting is the shepherd had to come first. 
And then the kings, you know, if the kings would have come first, well, of course, the shepherds are coming. They're going to steal, kill them and take all their goods. But the fact that the shepherds come first means that their motives must have been real. You know, in the Christian story that they were there for the king and then the kings come after the shepherds. So there's a model, you know, there's a model there in the same way too. you know, the Torah, generally speaking, there's a law that basically you're going to fail. Right. There's a law. That's a fail. And Jesus is like, but yeah, you had to go through that because your hearts were too hard to get to this place where you can have this sort of change. Oh, and by the way, I'm not actually getting rid of an iota of that. You know, you're still actually going to fail according to that. But that's precisely where the role of, say, grace and mercy will come up. A way to look at it is like you have the structure of a tree, the end, but you need that structure to have the bark on the outside. You know, you need the law to have the grace. So there is absolutely a very profound. I mean, you were talking, I was listening to the Tantra stuff. There's this idea that one is intentionally holding themselves back in a sexual act, the reason you're doing the sexual act is not to hold yourself back. There's an intentional paradox in a way there, but there's something about, you know, the, it's like the shepherds have to come first or I'm the good, you know, I'm the good shepherd. What? Uh, and basically, and, but there's something about these paradoxical principles, like these paradoxical ways of thinking. Like, like, for example, you have to think in order to figure out the best way to live, but thinking at the end of the day is a kind of bet. It's just a probability. You can never get full coherent. Like I have to think about this computer to use it, but my thoughts never equal the computer. It's always a map that isn't the territory. Like our very structuring of epistemology and ontology is very much paradoxically structured. It's paradoxical. Oftentimes it is fake, yet we can relate to it in an authentically fake way. We know it's fake, yet it's authentically fake. Yet the realness of it is precisely it's fiction. <sighs> you know what the hell this this is the kind of i, I I'm, I'm i'm getting to a point where i'm <sighs> fuck i don't know man somebody pick up now no well i mean I'm what you're saying too much no well there's something about these paradoxical like like one of the hopes of the conflict of mind is if you can show that um thinking epistemic like um epistemic responsibility comes in conflict with epistemic responsibility and then you can also show that the human ontologically entails a sort of incompleteness following reconstructing mm-hmm. asa um if you if you can do these yeah. sort of things you can start breaking down a legacy of philosophies or ways of thinking that are more focused on a mac, ma, um a uh, a master signifier or different things like that all of that at the end of the day you see what it will also come down to is it will necessarily mean that um, human action and choice and commitment are going to be very, very important. And what I mean by that is thinking. If thinking and rationality are in the business of complete coherence, then thinking itself to itself can never give you the quote unquote tantra, if you will, or it can never give you the restriction. It can never give you the paradox. You have to act in a way that fills in or confronts the thinking, right? Like, for example, if you're... um. You know, if you're going on the wrestling mat, like I had to wrestle like a four time state champion as a sophomore, that was not good. Uh, but, you know, when you're going on the mat, you're thinking, I'm going to die. I'm going to get destroyed. But when you go, but you still do the action against that thought to go out there and face it because you know there's something important about it. It's basically inevitable you're going to lose. You are not going to beat a four time state champion as a sophomore and he's a senior. It's just not going to happen. You know that. You know that. But there's something important about the act of doing it and putting up the good fight. Even though there's so he ended up, you know, he didn't he didn't pin me. He beat me on points. Uh, But losing on points is different than losing on a pin in the first round in 10 seconds. Right. Even though, you know, you're going to lose. But the way that you lose that thinking can only structure towards you generally as losing in the act of that loss, because there's a resistance and a fighting that you're you have a sense is valuable, even if you cannot completely put it in intellectual terms, is critically yeah. important. And here's the issue. So, and I think this gets, you know, um, so today in the loss of givens and so on and so forth, um it used to be like before 1915 or 1920, for example, um, you know, if you were going to run a house, you were probably going to do a lot of like, let's say mail, because what you know, men's work are different things. You probably had a blue collar job, right? You probably had a job that sucked. It was not something you wanted to do, and you probably didn't get any status, and you felt like crap at the end of the day. Um, it was not like a white collar corporate job you could go to, and people be, oh man, that's so awesome, you're doing these different things. No, 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 no. This is like Orwell, Wiggum's Pier. You're going out, you're doing this thing. This, this is what you did. So the structure of reality, if we're just talking about the male for a moment, had something with it that almost necessitated struggle, right, and sort of tension. And there's something about struggle that we're pointing to is necessary for the paradoxical ontology of the human. It's necessary. There's something about it that's necessary. 
Um, well, you didn't have to wait. Like the the world would give it to you. It would force you upon it. Likewise, you know, before yep. birth control, if you were a woman, you, unless you didn't have sex or you joined a monastery, you were probably going to have a child. Um, that's not to say that was better or not, but you, but it was. But the challenge of raising a child was given to you, right? It was this kind of very probable. Today, the issue is. Generally, we have to choose our challenges. <laughs> we have to submit ourselves to challenges. And it's not so necessarily the case that your job's gonna give it to you because you might get a lot of status or you might enjoy it. Or at the end of the day, it's intellectually challenging. Uh, well, that's all going to feed the problem of coherence maybe. But, but how, here's the funny thing. How do you rationally choose to submit yourself to hardship? That can never be rational. Rationally submitting yourself to hardship is insane. It's, it's rational. crazy. Only by- only by submission to the irrational. Well, what you have is kind of like you have you not attain rationally. What what happens is we all today, in order to get this um, proper way of being that we are basing on paradox and irony and these different things, is you have to make a non-rational choice, is what I like to say, to kind of escape the irrationality. Because you have a kind of game theory problem almost, like Nash equilibrium or different things. Like yeah, Nash equilibrium, and a, a term I use with Lorenzo is that it's a rational impasse. If everyone does what's rational, you get a suboptimal result. So what's happening is everyone is doing what's rational, which is avoid hardship and lower hardship and et cetera, so forth. But the problem is you get a suboptimal result. So now you need like men's retreat, or now you need like intentional efforts to submit challenge to yourself, which is non-rational in yeah. order to realize the full, fullness of your paradoxical state. But you're yeah. not going to do this, but, 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 but it's going to be very unlikely that you're going to do this if you only have the terms rational or irrational to think according to. That's why I think non-rational, uh, because that's also how you escape capture, uh, because rationality is set by the condition in the society. It's just like I was saying, the Protestant, right? You know, they were rational in their hermeneutics uh, of just the Bible, but the problem is they were rational according to capitalism, right? And they were reading that into the Bible without realizing. They needed to do something non-rational according to their paradigm to escape that capture. So in a similar way, in a society today that would have it be irrational to personally encounter and suffer your paradoxical nature so that you can fool yourself, you have to do yeah, something non-rational. And, and, and this is true. Uh, the tragedy is that only a tragedy will release us from meaninglessness. But I yes. would, and I would like uh, put a lot of oil onto this idea and set it on fire that only the utter dissolution of, you know, you give the example of the Calvinist versus um, perhaps the Catholics. Sure, sure. Uh, but you could just bring this bit of thinking uh, elsewhere. And precisely by bringing it elsewhere to its most tragic uh, potential limits then we'll we be able to think through some some level of meaningfulness um you know that's the tragedy of it that only a only a tragedy can release us from meaninglessness well uh, i mean that yeah. alludes um you know we got the meaning crisis or different things. i love the video y'all did with uh, dr lass and bard and different things and different things um you know what i what i think is really important to realize um is the the quote unquote meaning crisis. We actually do know the solutions. We have lots of solutions from history. You know, fascism, closed mindedness, racism, uniformity, all of these we could do at any moment we wanted. And some people are doing conspiracy will give you meaning, so on and so forth. The issue is that it's a it's a space where we have decided we're not going to do the old ways. Right. So we have a meaning crisis, not because we don't. People make it sound like we stumbled down a road and found ourselves in a dead end. And oh, crap, what are we going to do? When really the image I like to use, it's more like Thomas More, for example. He refuses to um, the the king wants to get a divorce. And Thomas More is like, no, you can't do it. Or maybe uh, Leonidas from the movie 300 or something. You know, all you got to do is bow, dude, and you can get out. We can get out of the meaning crisis, quote unquote, if we use that phrase here, at least. All we got to do is just let the king get his divorce, right? All we got to do is bow to Xerxes. But because we don't accept those solutions because of our principles and values, we're not going to do it, right? The problem is a lot of the meaning crisis right now is trying to be solved, I think, according to pure rationality or autonomous rationality, when really what we need is non-rational action or activities. Yeah, yeah. Or- and, and, and that more ra- uh, more irrational action the, that could and un- un- unleash sort of the resolution and the, 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 the coming about of meaning. The thing is, what if that requires thinking through a deep tragedy, thinking oh, through the deep, like, you know, because oftentimes we think about these things and, and, and I've heard you like right now, just say, because of our values and what we believe in, what is good, uh, we will not do these things and we will do other things. 
Uh, sure, and I agree with that. But what if what if that is not enough? And what if only the utter horrors of of like the depth of 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 if we do not risk destroying ourselves, we are not risking thinking through the deepest tragedy that will unveil the meaning that is necessary to push through the limit. Uh, so faithfulness to values is not enough. The destruction and the tragedy of values is the minimum viable action. Could it be that that's the case? Like thinking through our own personal destruction, our own the, the, the dissolution of our own tragedy and values, right? Um, and, and quarreling with that, like yourself, um, then we're able to break the impasses that everyday situations, uh, impose on us. And that, you know, I'm making myself clear. Very clear. Um, I think what you're getting at is very important. So there's this great essay by the Southern writer Flannery O'Connor, and she writes on Walker Percy one time. Uh, I think he had won the uh, a big award for his movie, his book, The Moviegoer. And somebody asked Walker Percy, he's like, why does the American South have so many good writers? You know, why, why is it? And Walker Percy said, because we lost the Civil War. Yeah. <laughs> like, because we lost the Civil War. And the point that he was getting at, and that Flannery O'Connor expands on because he gets into Faulkner with the Compson family and Sound of the Fury and Absalom and Absalom, different things, is the idea that the South had their idols destroyed, kind of like their golden calves, they were destroyed. So their whole value system was obliterated. And as a result, um, the stories have to be about human beings facing the fact, you know, in The Sound and the Fury, it's Caddy's uh, virginity, for example, that devastates Quentin when it's lost, right? So all of these stories had to sort of evolve around what does the human do? Uh, love in the ruins, or as is an, a, another phrase that Mr. Percy uh, those. And there's something about the ruins, if you will, that brings out um, the human being. And that seems to have a sort of necessary role in bringing out. And, yeah. you know, the other thing, too, if we look at literature, all the great literature, I think Harold Bloom is correct on this irony paradox you know obviously don coyote is a good example of, you know all of the in hamlet or fellow different things. irony paradox are big characteristics of the great literary works um and hopefully the the breaking of the day book will will go through that more more uh, in more detail but and also the failure of the surrounding value systems you know another way to say or to be caught between value systems and to not know what they are and the inner conflict that that brings a good way to look at hamlet is that he is caught between Athens and Jerusalem. We mentioned this at the end of the wonderful get together with Cadell Laz at the end of the year. He's, uh, you know, his dad shows up dressed as Apollo. He's dressed in his armor. A Greek person says, go kill your uncle. Uh, but he's in a Christian society. So his mission is following a Greek uh, value system, but he's in a Christian society that would make that sense. So what does he do? There's an inner conflict. So there's either a collapse of values there's a uncertainty of values that seems to have some necessary component of the human. And if great literature seems to suggest that this is what is the stuff of great stories, and if we believe that story and meaning are deeply tied together, then we as human beings seem to need some kind of story in our own personal life that has some glimmers and reflections and embodiments and likeness of this great literature of which would then therefore necessitate some sort of ruins or paradox or sort of failure. But here's, of course, the great problem. All right. So generally speaking, uh, let's just use 1950 as a good border again. You could go to war with someone or you could have a financial collapse and suffer for a bunch of years and society could keep 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 going. Right. Well, if we look at, say, Homo um, Deuce uh, by uh, Yuve, I can never say his name or different. Thing. You know, he right. talks about how mutually assured destruction is why, you know, the capitalism has done so well and and all these different things. And one of the things that's interesting about meta modernity, which is another lovely phrase, is that we actually don't personally encounter failure as much, like directly, like in our external environment, um, because we've like perfected everything. And also if the like if the dollar were to lose the reserve currency, that could like depress the entire global economy. And if you went to war, you know, millions of people could die or different things. Um, so the experience of death is less personalized. We're saying World War II. Your neighbor probably had a son go off to war. You probably had impacts of the war. So there's this sort of devastation that everyone not just knew about abstractly, but personally encountered that seemed to have some sort of formative element. Now, I'm not saying that human beings require war or different things like that, but there's something about how maybe through a lot of history, it was more likely that there would be a shared experience of ruins, right? Of which then could be something that brings out these necessary dimensions. Well, today, 
say a shared experience of ruin could be really, really bad and may not be an option, which would then therefore mean we have to submit ourselves to something of such that can have these positive impacts on us. But again, that brings us to a non-rational choice. Uh, and then what exactly does that look like? And, and do we need to do it with other people? You know, if you submit yourself to your own individual non-rational tragedy so that you develop in the way that you're describing, but your neighbor doesn't, it might be like you occupy an entirely different universe. So are there communities that need to create these struggles? I mean, all of this gets us into the incredibly profound question of praxis. Like, actually, what are the ritual, like, religions or orthodoxy? Which is why ontological design, uh, if it is to be well done, needs to be close or incorporate gambling and irrationality. Uh, mm. in a measure of stupidity and, and, and that sort of risk. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't include that aspect of necessary failure to generate momentum. Gamble, throwing dice in that sense is a beautiful metaphor uh, because you put your bet onto something that hasn't happened yet and there's a gap between now and that, which is the falling of the dice. Um, and oh, completely. It, that's why gambling is such an amazing thing and casinos like uh, are huge, not amazing, but it's huge precisely because you're betting against the future and you're circumscribing the tragedy that mediates the path between you and that future. And you're giving it means for expression. You're giving it an artifact or a series of games and cards and symbols and all that. Um, and so, so, <laughs> This is also why I'm so fascinated and, and usually like circling around and, and oh, and you know this, around this these ideas of sometimes bringing up the topic of war and conflict and competition and all of that, precisely because I feel that there's a level of irrationality in that without which, and maybe there's some, some disambiguation to do here. I think there is, but there's a level of tragedy in it that I sense is necessary. Maybe not gratuitously, not directly, because it's not an option at this point, but maybe we should disambiguate it further than, but I feel like it is, you know, we are now at the age where so many of the, and, and you know, I've lived in Denmark for like two months and I, oh, okay, this is what a society with zero problems looks like. It's ridiculous. It's, it's perfect. And, and, and I'm like, okay, ah, now I get like, Meta Moderna, the Hansi, when he says, after you solved everything, what happens next? Because it's a real thing here. Like, there's no problem, there's zero problem. And so, I mean, there's obviously like the only ones are social. Let's put it like that. There's, they're not material, they're not circumstantial. And so, what do you do from then on? Um, that's that's uh, one of the angles that I try to tackle with, with design, with it, which is the managed purveyance of disasters sometimes. Not its indefinite suspension, but it's like a vaccine. Uh, giving giving you a little bit of disease, giving you a little bit of it. Uh, I, I like that notion of the managed purveyance, though. Like, I think mm. we've been spending a lot of time with Gerard this month because we're teaching him in the Manifesto Media Academy, right? And he has this mm. concept. Thomas spoke about this when he was here. It was really good. I sent that to so many people. That was so good. Yeah, we I did another one yesterday, which should be coming out in a few days. But mm. um, so pseudo masochism. So mm. this is the state of kind of unconsciously, semi consciously stumbling into situations that lead to a feeling of defeat, so as to avoid actually facing the world and the possibility of being defeated by the world. So it's kind of the ego clutching back defeat from the world. It's like, okay, rather than stepping onto the wrestling mat and potentially losing, for example, the night before my wrestling match, I'm going to stay up till 3 a.m. drinking Red Bull and watching porn so that when I step onto the mat, I've already kind of been defeated. And yeah. so the, the wrestling match is probably going to suck. It's probably going to be miserable. But on some level, my psyche gets the feeling of, okay, but if I hadn't done that, then maybe I stood a chance. And I think this is the thing to watch out for in these conversations. And this is probably, say, the difference between a kind of like skillful tantric way of profane disaster versus just being pseudo-masochistic is doing it in kind of like stepping 
into uncertainty, but not out of the desire to be defeated. And that's very difficult. Like we could even see in, say, the character of Raskolnikov, there's this kind of, you're going to kill some, in an innocent old lady. You're probably going to be racked by guilt for that. There's an element of Raskolnikov. He's already kind of miserable, right? You've already been saying he feels inadequate. And so all he does is he creates a situation that legitimizes his, his inadequacy. And it's only at the very end that he transcends beyond that. So here's what that brings up to me, Owen. Uh, There's a little, it's a tricky place, isn't there? Because if it's really a managed purveyance of tragedy and and disaster, then it's not really risk. Then it's not really disaster. Unless someone else does it for you and then it's kind of a walled garden type game. Well, the Garden of Eden might have been one of those and that just again presupposes the figure of the great architect or just the normal architect laying out the chessboard for you to have your disasters. That's one option, but it gets a little bit tricky because then it's not really risking, is it? Whereas there's the other thing you said, which was cool, which is like you're going into situations where you can be defeated and knowing that defeat might be a way to win in the end. So it's like when you're in an argument, you're in an argument in a high stakes meeting and you're, Sometimes accepting the point the other person wants to make or two or three of those points because you know you want to make the fourth point and you're just fucking smoothing the way up until that. So it's purely tactical. And, and, and there's a level to that that just strikes me again as, is it really risky? Uh, there's a little bit of risk. It's very managed. Uh, and all that I wonder is, within the spectrum of risk that isn't managed and that could really be tragic and holy shit, what, you know, a war that invents a moral system for 80 years or something very managed <clears throat> like a slot machine in a, in a casino and all you have is $10 and you know, you, you, that's all you're going to lose. So there's this spectrum of risk. Well, and and there's no master signifier for the management. And that's the thing. It's always just kind of being on the race. If you manage it yourself. and the, But that's why it's fundamentally an artistic way of being rather than a rational way of being. I would flip that non-rational. It's, it's art, right? You don't quite know what's going to come out. Yeah. You just kind of have to trust in your pen or your guitar. And sometimes it's going to suck and sometimes it's going to go well. But there's just a kind of ethical duty to the act itself. I highly agree. And that's why you have... That's why it's better to throw dice than it is to play a game of cards where you're playing both sides, which I used to do as a kid. Uh, where, so because if you are designing your own personal managed purveyance of disaster, then it's not really a disaster because you're managing it yourself. So you're playing both sides of the same game of the chessboard. It doesn't work. So it's better to throw dice. It's better to do music. It's better to have this art. No, okay. What do you have to say, Dan? Uh, outstanding. Um, what you were saying. No, and, oh, I'm a big fan of associating aesthetics, flow, mm-hmm. all these things with non-rationality, uh, because there is something about that artistic risk or that the creative risk, especially when we start expanding, create, you know, the creative risk beyond just painting something or something like that, right? The risk of trying to bring about a world that you may not succeed at bringing about or bringing about a difference or whatever that you might genuinely fail at, and everyone will point at you for failing, and yet, nonetheless, you take that Kierkegaardian leap of faith. It does remind me what Kierkegaard meant by the leap of faith is something more akin to that, where he wants to almost like you got Eric um, Fonde and Existential Monday that I've been reading with Davout and different people who want to talk about that the problem of rationality is that it necessarily limits you to a structure that means you're susceptible to capture. And therefore you have to like for Kierkegaard, like you have to ultimately take a leap of faith, meaning do something non-rational or creative act because otherwise you can't be fully human. You know, it's not merely a theological position. It's something that's having to do with non-rationality. Um, so I, I think that's, I think that's um, extremely important um, for me. Uh, oh, I did also want to note, it's really funny that you bring up gambling because I was reading like this book out of 1870s and it was about gentlemen's clubs like a few <laughs> weeks ago. And I'd never thought about this. And it was talking about how actually gambling was really important to the formation of the, the gentleman, if you will, uh, oh. because it was a it was a contained safe environment. Now it goes through the etiquette of gambling, if you will. And it says, you know, you can't like have them put their life savings or different things. There's like everyone gets a hundred, but like it's a real amount of money that you're going to feel pain if you lose. 
but you're not going to have your life ruined. And he said how that was really important because it taught people to take risk, to take investment, to figure out that, you know, you really, really think you're going to win this hand and then you don't. So you learn the limitations of your ideas and you learn to be humble. And it was actually talking about how gambling in this way could um, could be a, uh, a good thing. And I thought it was really interesting. Um, it also makes me think like gambling in sports. You go out, you could literally break a leg, like you could be hurt. There's a kind of gambling there. There is, for me, I had a really lovely conversation once with my good friend, John Trossi, who's a tremendous guitarist. And I love playing harmonica with him. Um, and we had this conversation about how you actually don't learn what a choice is until you like invest. And we were talking, and we were talking about the stock market in this context. Man, I'll tell you what, the stock market will teach you crazy things. Like you're like, man, I really think this company's gonna do well. Let me tell you guys, uh, you you've done all the research, you've read all the forms, you did whatever, and you still lose, you know, a thousand bucks or whatever, right? Uh, you know, you learn that there's something about investment, like, and also too. A, a choice that's bad today because you've lost $1,000. If you just hold on for another month, well, now you've made $1,000. So a bad choice can be relative to when you stop, right? It can turn into a good, there's always a flip moment. So there's something about the stock market that actually I think can be good. For, we were talking about it in the context of teaching <clears throat> kids in school, how like training, like having them do stock market experiences uh, can actually teach you what real choices are like. They're not binary. Like in the stock market, it's a dynamic system of choices. Like you make a choice over here that makes sense, but then they get bought out and, you know, different things that... Uh, uh, different things like that. So it can be dynamic. I think for me, the concept of investment is kind of helpful because also too, I was saying earlier that to do something non-rational, like it's like, how could you mentally make yourself do that? But if you think of it as an investment that you have to do in order to see the fruits of and thus flip it into being a good decision or a bad decision, but you have to do it, you have to take the risk. Then we can start to see that there is something about risk about taking a stand or taking a leap of faith or a commitment to something that becomes funda fricking mental to the formation of the human being um, to really commit. And I think one of the problems with our world today is that everyone is commitment phobic. Now that sounds like I'm talking about relationships. No, 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 no. I'm talking about like everything. I mean, we're talking like jobs, people. And I'm not saying you should stay at your job for 30 years if your boss is beating you up. But, and, and I'm not saying there's something bad with change up, but there's something about, I think it's important for a human being to have something in their life um, whatever it is um, that they're truly committed to, you know, uh, at the, you know, Voltaire at the end of candy talks about like tend your garden. I always have that image, right? Like, do you have a garden that you're really tending to? And I like the metaphor of garden because the things in life that we commit to that seem to be what bring out the best in us, dare I say, tend to be things you don't fully control. Like you can plant the seeds right in a garden. Michelle talked about it. I love it once he talks about the garden. You know, you can plant the seeds right. You can water when you're supposed to and the deer can still eat all your kale. You know, you could do what you say. And then there's a frost at the freaking end of August. There were never frosts at the end of August. We had a frost at the end of August. And you're like, oh, and he kills everything. You know, it's not fair. And, and you go out and weed and you do all these hundreds of hours of work and it gets and it gets destroyed. You work for years and years on a novel and you, you take it out and you send it. And because of COVID, all the literary agencies are not accepting things. It's like, is that fair? Well, you know, no, but it doesn't. But you do it. You take that stand. You take that commitment. I like to call it a real choice at the end of Reconstructing it, like a real choice. Um, another thing that's funny, um, you know, how everyone today is like they don't feel real. Nothing feels real anymore. Like, how do we know it's real out there? There's kind of this fakeness to everything. Um, there's this great part in a book, um, Blackness Visible by Charles, um, Charles Mills. He's a really good um, thinker in uh, African-American thinking. And he had this point where he was saying, you know, the very question of other minds exist is kind of fundamentally Anglo, you know, white. Because if you're a slave, you know other minds exist because they force you to do things, <laughs> you know? So, you know, so you don't ask if other minds exist if you're a slave. Like that very question has a certain privilege in, in it. That was really profound for me. Also, there's something about a commitment, like a real choice that you can never go back from that you're like, this is my stand. This is what I'm doing. The world feels very real because you can't escape it. <laughs> it's there. And this is actually a positive, you know, I use the negative example, but it's a positive way. Like when you really commit to something like to do like excellent uh you know and we talk like the different thing, like excellence there's something that makes the world feel real because you have that commitment because commitment entails risk and it entails investment and here's the funny thing almost by definition that is going to necessitate a personal encounter with failure with finitude with tragedy because whenever you could because you're not perfect the world has some randomness to it. So it's only a matter of time before that book you worked on for five years when you were in middle school gets deleted on your computer and you have to write the whole thing again. 
Uh, you know, it's only a matter of time before, you know, the building code gets, or like with the, with the venue, it's only a matter of time before the whole, you lose all your wedding bookings because of something outside of your control. It's only a matter of time that whatever you're committed to and you're trying to do well, will present you with ample opportunities to realize that the Magner signifier does not exist. So in that commitment will come the personalized lessons that seem necessary for the human to fully realize themselves exactly as you, Mr. Prega, are pointing out. But that can only occur from a place of commitment, because from a, because if you're not committed, there's no real risk because you'll just back out before the risk goes bad. Do you see what I'm saying? Like you have yep. to have this sort of commit, this real hard stand to have that risk and therefore have that investment. But that seems really necessary in order for life to get a storied feel to it uh, and then to bring in the way of the great literature that we're describing a, a rising to the occasion. Uh, so I think that real choice is fundamental um, in, in, this, in this question that we are exploring. This is everything that the ideology of AI wants to eradicate. Exactly. Like, let's get the human out because the human makes mistakes. Yes. And I want to run my company well. And that means if I'm a certain kind of business leader, I wouldn't say all business leaders are like this, but there's the certain kind of bureaucratically minded business leader is if we could remove human error, then we could do our business best. And really there's in that as well, there's the fantasy of if, if I could remove myself, if I could just have the perfect machine that's going to run itself and presumably prevent the climate crisis. Cause that's the other, that's a, like one of these goals that everyone fixates on because it feels like we can do it. There's, there's not a kind of like ethical, there's no element of real choice really in trying to stop this thing. It's just, let's do business better. Let's use the AI to make it work more rationally. I mean, this is what I'm kind of seeing in my day-to-day -day work at the moment. It's like, that's the kind of ideology that's all over LinkedIn, for example. How can we use AI to make better choices so we can avert this scientific disaster? And there is no space for what is the, well, there's no thinking beyond the terms of that particular game. I suppose that's that's the thing. That's why the ethical um, thing for someone who's committed committed to uh, creativity or truth or freedom of thought or something like that, the, the ethical thing for one person like that to do is to um, bring up the irrational, you know, in a joker type way. Uh, and then, and again, like Daniel, this, this, as you were talking about, there is no risk if you're not committed to something. You're absolutely right. You can, however, be committed to, uh, and this is not a however, you can also be committed to things like more abstract, like creativity or, or faithfulness to, to yourself. And, and in that sense, these more abstract commitments can also yield much more tangible risks. Uh, you know, the artist is the art. When the artist is the art and when you're committed to sort of yourself in that, in that sense, um, like Raskolnikov was, because he saw himself as a project of art of becoming Napoleon, so to speak, then he risked it all in that moment. And in that sense, he was a total work of art, a tragic one, in that his total, his total existence was risked in that point. Uh, and obviously to break impasses like those of um, the sad uh, corporate uh, risk averse environments that uh, Owen and I are referring to. Sometimes to break those impasses, you maybe sometimes you don't and you, you do podcasts on your free time. Uh, but, but, but the ethical thing to do is sometimes to add that element of rationality. And I say this with some awe and mystery looking at it, that rationality, that, that, that potential oomph uh, beyond fantasies of positivistic overtaking of the whole world. Risk. Risk. And then win. <laughs> or lose. But like, do you get my drift? Um, oh, yeah. Well, you know, an argument like could that. be made that, you know, hopefully belonging again makes it, you know, I could be committed to, you know, the uh, the Third Reich or something, right? You know, so commitment could be bad, right? You know, this is where um, commitment itself cannot become a master signifier, right? Like you make it the answer. Ultimately, the answer, if it's going to avoid the quote unquote answer, that itself has a master signifier sound. But the, the way that we have to live has to be some sort of um, multiple, it has to be a toolbox. It can't be a one thing. So for example, if you have commitment, but you don't have discernment, well, you could end up committed to the Third Reich, right? Maybe you have, you know, 
you you don't want to have just non-rationality. You also want to have the rationality to be able to determine like the best thing to be non-rational toward, right? And you want a little bit of irrationality even where you just spontaneously do something like ask a girl out who becomes your wife, right? Maybe that's irrational. Uh, so, you know, there's a spontaneity. So there's three things there. You want all three in measure with one another. You know, I think I may have mentioned this in the talk. It's like the idea of true, beautiful, and good. You have that kind of Trinitarian idea. The problem is if you have goodness without truth, then it's probably what Ayn Rand was talking about with selflessness that controls everyone. But if you have truth without beauty and goodness, it's kind of stale and cold and it's quite bad. But if you have beauty without true uh, or and or goodness, then it's probably just manipulation because you see a, a lovely image and you're just kind of pulled in. So you literally have to have all three or basically the other three become bad. Like they're not, they're not good. In the same way, like if you're talking Christianity again, if you have to have God, the word God always means all three Father, Holy Spirit, and Son, all three at the same time. We usually don't say Trinity, but when you use the word God, you're talking about those three. And if Jesus, and without one of them, they all go. You have to have all of them to, to get any of them. So likewise, it would seem to be the case that human beings, c commitment, like this real jump seems to be really important. Um, the, the discern, like, again, we're talking about the incompleteness of rationality, but you need to be able to do rationality to personally experience that incompleteness. It's not simply enough to say, oh, well, rationality at the end of the day is going to be incomplete. Therefore, no, it's like, uh, Dr. Last phenomenological journey. You have to, you have to personally experience every stage of Hegel's movement up toward absolute knowledge. You can't just know about absolute knowledge and take the leap. You have to go through the work. So you have something like thinking is fundamental. Action is fundamental. Commitment is fundamental. I don't have the, th I don't have it written in front of me. I'm going to write notes and do a paper. Like, what are the fundamental toolbox? But it seems to be, for me, I talk about um, the fate of beauty is the fate of us. There's something about beauty that seems really quite um, uh, important. I mean, Kant even has the sublime giving us reason to think that our phenomenon might have something to do with what's across the noumenon, the critique of judgment at the end of it. That's an entirely different discussion. Uh, but there's something about beauty that's kind of paramount, um, truth, goodness, beauty. But to your point, yeah, exactly right. Like, you could have commitment and it not that alone won't necessarily be enough. In the same way that if we want to talk about like the extremely important men's work that y'all have done and Owen and different things, like um, you, it's it's not enough simply to do the wood cutting, you know, to go out and do the physical labor. You do also have to do some degree of mental work. But if you just do the mental work, there seems to be something that's also missing. But if you do both the mental work and the physical work, but never commit to anything. Well, then both of those are dead too, because you don't have that final step of risk. So it would seem to be a toolbox. And that's the way you would avoid a, um, I like to call it a poly theory, as opposed to a mono theory, you know, a mono theory being a theory of everything, a poly theory being many theories that come together that inform one another to create the, the best way there. But a poly theory as such only works for the active thinker. And our brains hate being active and, and also doer, like the active thinker and active doer. And we biologically, it seems, do not like that. Our lizard brain does not like that. Our lizard brain doesn't like risk. We like risk. We like to save energy. So there has to be. And right there is a kind of um, negativity. Your own physical state has a kind of negativity that's making it so hard to do these things. But if you can rise to the occasion of responding to the challenge that your own physical and biology, um, biological state presents to you, then that can be turned into a negation as opposed to an effacement, to use that language I like to use, which then can become a sublimation in, in a good way. And I think basically the issue is that today uh, we have to be very intentional about designing that, ontologically designing that, because the, 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 the society does not just give it to us, per se, in the givenness, like we were saying before the 1950s. Uh, but, that, but that requires one. It, you know, it's hard to uh, it's hard to use a map if you don't know where you are. So that first requires, you know, figuring out where you are so that you can know where you want to go. All while realizing at the end of the day, your idea of where you want to go, since the map is not the territory, might entail failure. And therefore, the very act of following the map entails investment and risk. Mm -hmm. And precisely by failing, a clearer idea of situations arises. Oh, yes. Mm. Remarkable. Well, it's very unlikely you're going to be perfect. So, fail, you know, I like to say failure is the sweetener of success. It's also a North Star in many mm. ways, a negative one that can never fail to orient you. Mm. Um, we're coming up to like the two, two, two hour mark, two hours and 10 minutes. Um, is there anything, right. Owen and Daniel, you'd like to, to throw in as we, as we begin to wrap? Anything that, that was left unsaid? 
I meant to get my piano so Owen and I could jam because he was going to do the guitar. I just couldn't bring that thing up here. So I'm really sorry, Owen. I know you were ready to do it. We're going to start a band here. Frank we'll save that singer. for next time. I mean, I okay, was just good. thinking we've got to get together all of this lot in person sometime. That would be awesome. Spend a week or two somewhere with awesome. instruments, with notepads. With hey man, time. I've got a porch. It has a nice view of the field. I also have barn cats that like to come up randomly. So if people want to pet something, it's there, you know. So, you know, the central Virginia is always open to you. Uh, I know there's this thing called an ocean that gets in the way of this. Uh, but no, I think that'd be a lot of fun. Uh, notepads and instruments. Oh, that's like a group. Notepads and instruments. Ah, band name. Notepads and instruments. First song, band name. Ocean in the way. <laughs> yeah, like song the, one, the, Oceans in the way. At Christmas with that crew on Cadell's channel. We oh, can that easily do that in person. That would be fun. Yeah. Well, luckily I'm Portuguese, so oceans don't. Uh, I mean, I'm here with an Englishman. Oh, yeah, you're good to go. You're Portuguese. That's perfect. They're like I'm supposed to know about boats, but I can't really speak too much because there's an Englishman in the in the room. Well, so. hey, I'm English too, so you know. <laughs> but uh, but no, I you know I would just say as a final thing, I I just would stress that um you know Mr. Frega, I think the work that you're doing on ontological design is incredibly important because if we don't own our ontological design, we're still going to be ontologically designed and not know it. In the same way that if we don't own the act of interpretation, we think we're just reading, but we're still interpreting it, and therefore we read poorly. So I think the work that you're doing is very important. I look forward to your book. Uh, it's magnificently really it's just very elegant. Uh, you know what what I've had the fortune of reading on uh, medium and different things. So I think it's marvelous work uh, mr 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 cox i think the work the men's work uh i'm going to have to get i'll continue to pressure you the work that you've done on mr zizek on antica i'd love to read that uh so i'll continue to make you feel guilty until i get that document uh but uh the work that you're doing on cultivating these different things moving i i think it's really important i, I love the channel uh i again i i see it uh, the lack of that that work on you know focused on men uh i, I see the consequences of that not existing and i think it's it's devastating. So I'm, I appreciate you doing that. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak with both of you uh, for the last two hours and 10 minutes. Uh, you know, I'm a ha I have two hours and 10. Like I said, tonight, I can go to IHOP, sit down 2am. I don't know what it is over there. Get my smothered uh, hash browns and do it again. But I've, I've really enjoyed this gentleman quite a lot. So thank you. Thank you, man. It's been a lot of fun. It has. Yes. Likewise. It was very, very fun. Thank you for, for coming on. Okay. And, um, We'll we'll keep on seeing each other and, and speaking Excellent. on various platforms and, and emails and all of that. So thank you. Thank you. All righty. Have a good one. Bye, fellas. Thank you. Bye bye.